Okay, but all right, everybody, welcome to episode number seven of the hot seat. We are about to officially bring it in. I appreciate you guys if you're watching it on Twitch, YouTube, Spotify, wherever it may be. This is the show where, you know, we bring some of our best minds and awesome personalities across the Gears of War community. We talk about Gears Esports and just Esports in general and whatever comes to our, you know, and whatever questions you guys have, whatever we're thinking about today and uh, whatever the state of the game is. So today on the show, uh, you know, I got a great combination of, of, of men with me, men with great beards, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch, <laughs> as you can see on your screen. Uh, you know, we have your uh, your two-time coaching champion, Fatal Strike himself, recently coming off a win in San Diego with Team Reciprocity. So much love to Fatal. Uh, shout out to Torchy for following the channel. If you guys heard those lion noises, if you're watching it on the Spotify, that's where that's coming from. We got a little follow coming in and turn them off. But much love to Joe. Uh, we have Jippy McCloud. We've known Jippy since Gears 3 days. He's been around the Gears of War community for a long time. Uh, amateur player, but long-term and, and well-respected community member. J uh, Jippy does a lot for the community. Make sure you guys... Uh, I'm following him on Twitter and checking out the content in which he's making. And then, uh, you know, last but not least, we got uh, old school. No, 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 no. We're just going to say we got your Dallas 2009 Gears 2 champion, Skyless, in the building as well. Uh, back in the day from, from ZYN and Skyless was a part of the community since day one. He is one of the guys in, in which who I met back in 2007. He was one of the guys in which I met back in 2007. Uh, and, you know, he's been playing Gears of War since then. Uh, you know, played with VBI and ZYN. You know, later left and got to work on Fortnite and uh, do those uh, and work on work on those competitive systems. And, Skylar, you might as well just tell me, what, what was some of the stuff you was doing over there at Fortnite? And I'll let you guys kind of go around the board and say a little bit about yourselves uh, while, I, while I turn down uh, these notifications. So, Skylar, can you start with you? Yeah, so uh, as you said, former pro player, then uh, went into the games industry in QA, uh, worked on Halo 4, Doom, a little bit on Call of Duty, and then uh, moved out to North Carolina and worked on Paragon and then Fortnite most recently uh, as a designer, uh, building out the uh, in-game tournament system and competitive features and stuff. I actually left Epic in December, um, currently just between jobs, uh, working out a bunch of side stuff and kind of playing out the future. Nice, nice. Jip? Yeah, I've been in the game a long time, like you said, Blaze. I've been around since the first game came out, and back then I did not have a beard, believe it or not. <laughs> I actually was clean shaven. <laughs> but I've been here just with you guys, whether it was in the trenches or whether it was at Meadowlands, I did attend that event as well. I got my head shot off many times by... Those that you talked about earlier, that dirty snipe that um, IBV had, I hate that thing, man. He kept shooting my head off every time I saw mm. him. But, you know, it's just been such a whirlwind of emotions and fun over the years, whether it was from the MLG days, then to the ballroom days, and then back to MLG and so on. And overall, I mean, I've just been the community for a long time. I love this community. I love the game franchise. I go out of my way to try to defend it as much as I can in a reasonable effort, so to say. Yes. But other than that, I own my own multimedia studio business with my wife. We do web design, graphic design, Ooh. all that stuff. That's and awesome. then I also am a full-time teacher at a school of technology where I live at, where I teach the same things that I end up doing for business. So. Oh, that is awesome. See, the, the more you know, okay, we'll be in contact later on, all right? You know, see? All right. See, <laughs> this, <laughs> the more you know, it's always nice to know who within the community in which you can kind of, uh, you know, go to to get some work done. You know, we love keeping it in the family, all right? Especially, uh, you know, the ones that do good work. And I've seen some of your work. You know, I've seen the stuff that you've done and you've put out on Twitter and on your website. So awesome stuff over there. And Joe, uh, you know, you give us a little something, something nice, short, and sweet about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. We always got to say short and sweet. So I'm kind of <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, long story short, I mean, I kind of, I've been here since day one for Gears. But uh, I was always like kind of like a like a local like player for a long time. It took me a little bit to uh, get into the competitive scene on like the national level, like the MLGs and stuff like that. But over my career, I won 31 local tournaments, not majors. And then 
Um, played in the European scene uh, after a couple of events in 2008 with playing with pickups. And in the European scene, I placed pro twice. Then I commentated for a while after Gears kind of took a break. Made a comeback during UE, won an award for most improved player of the year. And then after that, like, grinded my way to uh, becoming pro in the U.S. And then when the game switched to years four and five, I switched over to, like, a coaching role for tw 2018 with Ghost. We went 3-2-1, won, won, won a championship. And then now with uh, Reciprocity, just at the very end of 2009, we closed out another championship, which was the first tournament that was a major land in Gears 5. And that's pretty much it. So I've gone from like the player to the commentator to, you know, working with developers like Epic Games in the past and trying to work with TC now. And then, uh, you know, managing and coaching eventually after placing pro with TK and all that. Awesome. Nice. And that's nice. pretty much it. Nice. Yeah. And so that is, uh, you know, our entire crew. If you guys don't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about myself, but, you know, I'm just Blaze. All right. If you guys uh, don't know me, Gears of War Esports commentator. Uh, and, and, you know, and that's all y'all really need to know. I bring the action, I bring the hype, and most importantly, uh, you know, I just want to bring you guys some, some awesome content, uh, for you to, you know, you know, be thinking Gears of War and to, you know, give you guys a place to just share your opinions and, you know, how you feeling today, okay? So, uh, some of the things that we talked about beforehand, uh, of what we want to discuss on a show is that, one, I want to talk about uh, the amateur player experience and their path to pro. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we got Jippy, uh, uh, Jippy on the show. Uh, Jerpy, not Jippy McLeod, sorry. Okay, I'm thinking, you know, we got a lot of gyps. <laughs> no <worries>. Jip, <laughs> we got a lot of gyps in the community. Gyps, gyps, all gyps the, and jerps, right? All the good stuff. Gyps and, and jerps. Like all, candy, man. All, all very efficient at their job, though. Let's just make that clear. Yeah, and then uh, and then we have Fatal Strike over here with, you know, Coach of, of Reciprocity, and he's bringing that pro player uh, you know, standpoint of how it's been for them. And then on, on the flip end, we got Skyless, uh, you know, someone who understands the gear scene very well, but he's been watching from the outside and, you know, and he has his opinions on how, on how things go. So, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so that's awesome. So I say, uh, you know, I think we could just, we could, we could start the conversation now. And, uh, I think we can kind of start it more so, on a on an amateur scene, right, and on the amateur players and and kind of their grind and and how it's been for them, uh, you know, kind of climbing to the top. You know, Jip, I've seen some of the great things that you've done on your website, uh, keeping up with the challenger points and, and how those guys are are being ranked. And I'm gonna put that link in the chat for you guys in case you guys want to go check it out sometime. Uh, but you know, Jip, you know, I'm, I'm gonna open up the mic for you on the floor and for you to uh, you know, kind of say how your experience been and, and to lead us off. All right, absolutely. So to begin, I will start off with a positive note before I get into constructive criticism. I will say one thing's for sure, that the way that PGL was trying to do things with their rule book was actually some good ideas. Mm. But with that being said, let's talk about all of the things that amateurs have had to go through the last several months. And even some of the pro teams even that are on the circuit now, including High, for example, we'll talk about them a little bit as well. First off, we were kind of caught off guard, not only amateurs, but the whole scene, because we made the big leap from Major League Gaming over to the PGL organizers. And yep. at first, we weren't really sure what to expect, especially since a lot of us amateurs watch the TBS broadcast at home. We were kind of Feeling the hype, all the media that was done for that, and the live production seemed great. So we had really high expectations. But then came the starting of the esports circuit. And I can't express this enough. The way that it started off was rather hectic. There was a lot of teams trying to figure out how to register themselves as a player, trying to register themselves as a whole team. And then on top of that, when PGL first opened up, they had a ladder system. And then they had their weekly tournaments that came later. But the ladder system wasn't what we were expecting. And what I mean by that is for those of you that are veterans that play game battles for four, three, two, whenever you did, the way that it worked is you would make your team. You would end up clicking on, let's find a match. You would end up finding which one you wanted to choose. And you would choose it and get put against a random team. And that was on game battles originally. Yes, that was on game battles. But for some reason, PGL didn't stick to that type of thought process. And one of the first things we experienced that was really wrong was 
you on the PGL system were allowed to challenge a team. So the problem with that is not only since it's with ranking and standings, because Mm -hmm. for the first so many weeks, it was basically try to get to the top of the ladder so you can be in the pro league qualifier. And the issue with that was, let's say, for example, I have my team and I'm looking down below and I'm like, all right, here's a few teams that are really awful. I'm just going to keep going against them every so many days and gain my points. That doesn't build skill. That creates less of a skill gap for all. And then on top of that, it just creates this issue where you can end up being rewarded constantly, but never go against someone that's higher skill than you and then properly learn how to become a better player. So yeah. not only are you kind of jinxing yourself and messing up your own team skill, but at the same time, you're really not progressing like the highest caliber of play from your team and the individuals. Now, gotcha. with, yeah, with all that being said, this is where it became a huge issue because when the ladders first started going off, PGL specified that you had to be, I believe it was the top eight teams, maybe the top six teams. It's been a while. But you had to be at the top by the end of the overall qualifier yeah. just to be able to go to the Pro League one. And it got to a point where two really bad things happened that really exposed the system. The first one was Hive, which is a Pro League team now. They were actually at one point on the outside looking in. They were, I think, like ninth or something, and they were trying to get more matches to get on the inside. Mm-hmm. But the problem with the challenger system is every time Hive eventually started trying to say, hey, we want to go against this team or that team, the teams that they were challenging, they are allowed without penalty to decline that match. (laughs) Say, oh, you need a few points? Nah, we good. (laughs) Yeah, so Hive was literally getting blacklisted from all the teams above them. And then all the teams lower than them were kind of getting this like weird look at them like, wait a minute, now you want to go against us? All this time you didn't want to go against us, and now you want to? So Hyde, which is a great team, love Coach Crazy Train and the whole crew over there, they just were kind of at a standstill where they were like, we know we're better than this, we know we should be in the qualifier, but no one wants to go against us, and everyone's blackballing us, basically. Now, luckily, there was teams that finally went against them and they were able to get their rightful spot with their high skill and caliber of play. But then became another huge issue. And that second issue was teams were making Smurf accounts in teams. And at the end of the qualifier, there was a team, I can't remember who was on the roster at this point, but they went by the name of Abusement Park. They okay. ended up having... Awesome name, by the way. Monster yeah. came up with it back in the day, so we just throw that out there. But continue. <laughs> yeah, a great name, but not a great philosophy in trying to be at the top of their game because they ended up having, I believe it was two official matches on record where they ended up going against this Smurf team. And I'm talking about literally generic Xbox Live silver gamer tags. Like... Fluffy Kitty 52 and Walking <laughs> the Stick 27. And they went against this team two different times. Now, mind you, at the time, no one at PGL batted an eye or did anything about it. They just were thinking, oh, these teams are playing against other teams, and that's it. Oh, well, I and, think I know where you're going with this. Yeah, and the only way that it was caught was because, again, I care way too much about the franchise, the integrity of the game. And what I realized was at the end of the most recent matches you played, you were allowed to look at if you were even on another team. You're allowed to see the last match that that team played. Mm -hmm. And the one time I saw it, and I literally looked at it, and I was like, wow, there's no way any of these gamer tags probably exist. They don't sound like they're even players. So I ended up screenshotting it. I ended up doing a bunch of research. I went on my Xbox. I started looking for these gamer tags. All five of the damn gamer tags, none of them even played Gears. <laughs> so I submit that all over, and I was like, listen, I'm pretty sure it is literally cheating wins to get into your qualifier, and that's going to ruin the integrity of our eSport. Can you please look into it? And luckily enough, they did look into it. They were able to specify that that team was, in fact, cheating. And although I did have, I believe, like one or two people from that team that came at my throat, so to say, through DMs and Twitter, I just kind of brushed off my shoulder. And after that, that's about all I heard from it. Like they stopped harassing me after a day. I had some 
community members come in and say, you guys are acting weird. I had one of them even change their avatar profile picture on Twitter, the uh, real picture of me, which I found very cute and weird. Just kidding, of course. <laughs> so there was all of those problems that was happening. With like, like we counts. see you, Jip. We know you were on a hunt for us. We know you went on your detective work, screwing things up. Come on. Yeah, and that's why, actually, I see Ryan's in the chat. Shout out to Ryan for everything he does at UMG Gaming and what he's done in Gears But shout out to those guys. Hey, Tuesday, Wednesdays, you know, you got Emergence Day and the Challenger Series over there at UMG, so don't forget that one. Right, he bad. actually came up with a hashtag during the time called hashtag case close for me, and I've been using that ever since in my articles and a few times when I write some of them, so shout out for that, by the way, Ryan. But then moving on with that, Another few things that happened, a lot of people ask me, why did I start keeping track of like the rosters and the seeding points and all that type of stuff? And the reason being, again, one, I love the community, but two, if PGL did not look into this really huge issue with a team almost making it going against mm -hmm. bad teams, what else were they missing? Yeah. And I got to tell you, as nice as I can say it, they were missing a lot. Mm. So there was multiple weeks, for example, where we would end up going from one Sunday tournament to the next, and they would not update the seeding points on their side. And so that just so messed up the whole bracket, right? Oh, yeah, multiple times. There was at least two times that I can count. I think it might have been three, but two that I know officially, so we'll stick with that number. And on top of that, what was happening was they would post the standings onto the Gears of War website, under the esports category regional standings and you could look at it but they would only go off of that so it was kind of like a tandem of if that didn't change then they weren't going to change and it created the brackets being screwed up multiple times which can cost the team i mean you can go from going against an easier opponent to a difficult opponent just by one seed movement so that was called out a few times but then I want to get to the San Diego event really quick. And I think we're going to talk about and, it later and, with and, Sky, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I just want to say that that is, that is so important, especially for uh, any player in a competitive environment, that they get the, the bracket in which they're designed to get because it's preparation involved in that up until the week. And we want our players uh, to, to, to be able to go to those levels and go to those depths and preparing and becoming better Gears players. So... The seeding, the integrity, that's super important, but continue. Before I get to the San Diego event, I will take one more little quick detour that I want to express. Okay. So another big problem that we've seen with the PGL way of doing things is the fact that when it comes to individual players, you don't really have anything when it comes to points. So what I mean by that is when we did game battles, you could grind ladders, you could mm -hmm. do the tournaments, and after the game was done, you yourself as a player got points. That way, if you were dropped or if you were kicked off the team or you needed to find a new team, you carry some weight with you. We saw earlier in the PGL tournaments with who some of you know as Musics, they were on a team that was doing really, really hot, and then all of a sudden, they were dropped from the team for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But then, to be dropped from a team that's getting ready to qualify to... Oh, yeah, I remember no this. Points, like, how the hell are you supposed to come back from that? Like, that's unacceptable. You literally worked all those weeks to stay afloat and be yeah. good with your team, and then you're dropped with just nothing. And as, so, a, and as, a, and as a player, like... You, you make sacrifices, you know, you set time aside to go on this grind and to, you know, be a professional player in Gears Esports and to go along those lines and you're working hard and you're working hard. And granted, you know, we've seen players get dropped for, for, for silly reasons, for silly reasons. And so even if you were doing your job and you get dropped, it's like your last few weeks mean nothing because you don't have anything, right? Because it's more so geared around you know, three players sticking together in the team carrying points rather than any given on an individual level. Yep, and that's exactly right. And then what ends up happening with the roster situation on a PGL is you always have to have three of the same players on that team from week to week. So you would end up having not only like two players get dropped one week, but then the next week two more players would get dropped and they just keep recycling or moving players and like after two weeks of play, say you got like four or five players that are now missed 
to their name. They're back to square one trying to figure out where they go. And sometimes that could be enough demotivation to even want to continue if you're an amateur. Mm -hmm. So I find that to be a really huge problem. But speaking of which, I will talk a little bit about San Diego really quick. Some people that are in the chat can probably and, reciprocate with some of these things. Oh, go ahead, please. Sorry about no, that. I was going to say, and, and Sky and Fatal, if at any point if y'all ever wanted to jump in, y'all can, but continue. So overall, from an amateur's point of view, I will say the live production at San Diego was pretty awesome. I'm not going to lie about that. I do actually give kudos for that. But with that being said, just a few basic things quick that were wrong, and then I'm going to jump into the issue that I thought was the worst. So a few minor things. First off, just like the pros uh, felt, as us amateurs felt, we got there, we were getting ready to play. Turns out the game was a new update that none of us ever played. Woo! So that's one huge issue that I'm sure Joe can talk about later because oh, yeah. he's got a lot of experience probably with that, with his oh, team, yeah. especially since you guys got out there a little bit earlier than some of us amateurs. Secondly, there was some referee issues. And what I mean by that is some of the refs were not really well informed on how Gears of War worked. And one of the matches in open bracket, the very first game happened. And they ended up winning one round on map one. And then the referee shut off the whole game, said, okay, you guys won. <laughs> Thinking the whole match was over. Wow. So that's kind of crazy. But... Other than that, like, let's talk about the one thing that's really got my mind boggled from a tournament organizer perspective. And Joe, you can chime in, maybe help me. I actually asked I got you. Ashes the other day about this, and I asked Blazing before the podcast started today. Uh -huh. So when the champ bracket was officially made, I ended up watching all the matches because unfortunately my team was knocked out by then. It happens. But... I ended up having MLG the Great, also the coach for the now No Mercy esports team, which was originally Vision before they just changed today, actually. Yeah. And Alex brought up something very keen to me. He ended up saying, we're going against Fire and Ice, but we're on the wrong side of the bracket. And I looked at him and I was like, all right, well, I don't know what I can do, but I am interested to look in at this. Because if that's the case and they're on the wrong side of the bracket, a champ bracket, mind you, then there had to be one more match that was not correct. So mm -hmm. comparing the graphic that was on the eSports handbook and comparing how the results panned out on the overall PGL results page, I ended up not only realizing that a vision was inside the bracket, but I realized that every single match in the first round, with the exception of two, were incorrect yeah we were talking about that to the staff too because we were all worried about it because at first you know originally when you when you do the seating right for the for the swiss bracket everyone's seeds are coming in usually from pro league so at first we were like wait a second um why are we going i forgot exactly which teams are going i'm going off memory but i forgot exactly which teams we were going up against at I the got, time i got the bracket right but, here yeah first match was rated r then it went regal reserve and then made there yeah, and then and then later on, I, I feel like um, we were worried because I guess what happened was we thought that we were going to be on NRG side of the bracket because, oh, no, yeah, no, uh, Mazer originally is who we thought we were going to be up against, and the bracket got all flip-flopped, but I can't remember what happened, but I definitely don't think we thought um, we were going to play the original teams we were playing. So you said we played Rated R first, um, then, we, then we played uh, Astral, and then who else did we play in Swiss oh, bracket? Oh, then we played oh, in Swiss bracket. We played we, Man, yeah, was, yeah. And, and then we stuff. played and then we played um what was the last team? Uh EU's finest. We had that crazy comeback against we were down 0-4 tiebreaker map. But I remember I like there was other teams that I expected to play when I was going through my notes. And I don't have it in front of me, but yeah. I was really thrown off by by the bracket at the time. I was like, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. And I remember talking to the team about it and then talking to the refs about it. Another weird thing that happened, not trying to get off topic, but I'm just going to say it while we're here and it's in my mind. But I remember having a huge debate with the refs at the event about the picks and bans because one of the refs was walking up to me. And then uh, I think I talked to Benson about it a little bit. And he was telling me that the whole picks and bans last second 
what's going to be changed. And I was yeah. like, bro, I was like, I understand if you guys are putting out an update last second. I was like, it does really suck. But they told us when we heard about that, that it was only the strafing speed, which obviously we all know now is not the case and not even close to the case. And it definitely threw off a lot of teams. Uh, but on top of that, I also found out that they were trying to switch up the way the picks and bands were going and that you weren't going to be able to choose your auto band first. And I was like, that's absolutely ridiculous. I was like, if you're going to make us play on a new update, it is what it is. Like, you guys are the bosses. But I was like, that's all. That's one thing messing with competitive integrity. I was like, but on top yeah, of that, now now you're going to make it so that a team could just pick our auto ban and, that, and then that's how we're going to play this. And then just whoever wins on the other team's auto ban possibly gets a huge lead for the match. I was like, that's ass. I was like, we can't just cancel out everybody's preparation going into the event. And what because happened I felt like it just kept happening time. again and again. What's up? I was gonna say yeah because it was be it was best of three all the way up until that point, but it was that last because you remember it was the last decision that the finals was gonna be best of five or at least towards the back end that that's what it yeah. was. But I think nobody had thought about the pick and ban process up until that point, and then uh, I think it was like teams had picked the map first and then it went bans. And then you was going to pick out the rest of the maps. but Yeah, that's what they, that's what they were trying to do. And I, I'm not going to lie. I was like but we one switched. second. I was like one second away from losing my cool in that moment. And, I try to stay really composed. And yeah, it got switched. And, and I think that was a valid point that both teams should just ban right away and then pick the maps in which, in which they want it. Should, it, 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 should, it should always be that way. It should never change. We're dealing with seven maps. We're dealing with tons of different matchups. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. it just, we want to see, like, the best out of each team. Like, I wouldn't want to play a team and be like, oh, yeah, let's just pick their auto ban if they have one. Yeah. And then we get a significant advantage. I won't even feel good about that win if we win that way. I want to play teams on, you know, their good maps. And, yeah, if we notice there's a weakness or whatever and we pick that map, they're still going to be decent at it because if they have an auto ban, you know what I'm saying, they're, mo they're not going to play it, obviously. So, I don't know. I just want to see teams, like, at their best and... But that's going to go into a whole other topic later when we talk about bouncing and stuff like that. But, yeah. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's what the whole show is about, right? It's, it's about, uh, you know, pretty much how do we create better Gears players and better Gears teams, right? And, and you know, and what's that experience for them? And, you know, because of that experience and, uh, you know, that path, that path to pro, so to speak, is, is what it's all about, you know? Uh, if it's laid out and it's consistent and it's there... And, you know, that theoretically, you know, we should be able to have any Gears player be able to hop into the system and to get better over time if, if they choose to, you know, if they, if, they, if they choose to go on that grind. All right, you know, and uh, yeah, so now nah, it's, uh, yeah, Sandy, you know, especially when it came down to, uh, you know, those little little changes here and there, you know, when I talked to you, Jeff, that was like the first time I heard about, you know, the bracket. And, uh, and and how those matches kind of you know stacked up throughout it all. Uh, Sky, did you get a chance to watch San Diego? No, I didn't catch any of it. Um, actually, I caught a match or two because I was curious about the update. Yeah, yeah. And the update was something that got put in towards the when an update came out. Um, you know, the escalation change update came out about like a, a week or two before the event, and I thought it was good. I, you know, I th I thought it was better than than the seven rounds. Can we all agree on that? That was better than five rounds in a seven. Five five rounds was one hundred percent um better. Uh, I don't. I, I have a different opinion when it came okay. to the boom and drops. I didn't think that it was terrible what it was there, um because if you were winning a fight, then usually you could close it out. But I honestly believe that at the time we were the best team in the game on that setting. So I mean, it doesn't surprise me that everybody else wants to switch. Uh, what I loved but... about, what I loved about the boom and drops, was what, what I loved about the boom and drops is that it did slow the game down. I think I think it, it made people have to second guess certain decisions and put some respect on it and, and have to think more on their plays. Granted, yeah. the plays that was happening, you know, I have a different opinion about because you know, just playing, you know, I just want to see more high level plays. You get what I'm saying? And uh, yeah. you know, you only gonna get a certain play with a boom and a drop. You know, people gonna be trying to make some you know high level decisions, but as far as the play and the gameplay, uh, you know, I like that tacticalness elsewhere. Well, also, the thing is with the boom shot and the drop, right, is when we were playing on that setting, the boom shot wasn't even used that much. I mean, you could see in the Mazer Pro League matches that they were getting ripped off when they were using that weapon a lot because the boom was actually really inconsistent. So many professionals didn't even rely on that weapon unless a guy was literally full red. And there were times where you would even shoot a boom and it would be a completely <laughs> blank boom. So the pros really weren't using the boom. It was coming down to the drop shot. And the thing is, no offense to some of these teams, but... 
there's actually not that many people that are really good with drop shot, to be honest. So a lot of the teams that don't have many people that are good with drop shot, they were just all anti-drop, get it out of here, you know, make it only in the middle of the map and just fight for it. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I, I didn't hate it as much as I think a lot of other people did. I think I'm probably one of the few coaches that didn't have a problem with a drop shot being on the sides. But I 100% agree that switching it to five rounds was better for the game. I also think that the second half does play out a little bit better now. For example, like when we were playing against, um, what was it, EU's Finest, and we made that 0-4 comeback, I don't think that would have been possible in seven rounds. Mm -hmm. But obviously for us, no, it worked it, out it really would've. well. It, it definitely would have it, happened. If you're down, down 6-0, I mean – you gotta win seven straight. We, I, did, we I, never I, saw it, by the way. In, in three years, saw, of, yeah. never saw it in three I, I, years of gears that we play. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it online, like gears with the four. old ghost. We did, we do do it once in gears four. Yeah, but it, that's different. It's online. Doing it online is not the same as doing it at land when people are running their best initials and they're trying their hardest to win. And, it's just not the same. Yeah, what happens is, as as like if you're down four zero and you get one round, it's like, oh, okay, cool, cool. You get two rounds and like just visually. 4-2 looks so much different in your mind than 6-2, right? It yeah, like, definitely helps the mental game. It hits, yeah. it hits so differently. And, you know, even like and you just get that much of a boost that you can come back. And then at the way that the, the life bank had worked, that if you did manage to chain together two rounds like that... You reverse the economy. Yeah, you, you reverse the economy. And most likely your opponents was probably already cocky. Because they have four rounds, right? And you know how players get. Yeah. Oh, we got a little lead. Let's just start doing our thing. We'll win it eventually. And then it's like, oh, shit. We're, well, hold up. Why are they coming back? Why it are they also, still momentum? It also really helped us out with what map it was. I mean, Vascar in general is a map where you don't really get many setups. I mean, if you're a coach and you track setups, you're not going to be seeing many base setups or like you'll see fallback setups more than anything else, but you're not going to see that many base setups. You're not going to see that many extended setups. Usually you're going to be mostly rotating around the map. Right. So mm -hmm. what I was talking to the guys is I was telling them, I was like, Hey, I was like, the thing is you guys need to just, you know, wake up, fix your micro spacing. You're taking a lot of really ignorant 50 fifties. You just need to change it up. And then I was telling them that if we just chill, if we chill out, you know, make our comms and then have really good rotations. I was like, we'll be able to turn this map around as long as we start winning initials. And I remember we were running uh, like a flawed initial, like two rounds in a row. And it was a big reason why we were losing. So I told them not to run that initial anymore. I just said, all we got to do is win two rounds, just like you said, and we could completely flip the economy. So I was actually really excited when we chained those two rounds together mm -hmm. and we started flipping it. And then we just ran a couple different strategies. I'm not going to say which ones we ran, but mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> they were different styles of strategy. And then it basically was never the same look again, like if you go watch the rebroadcast. And then all it came down to after that is once you get the lead, kind of like ring around the rosy in a way. Am yeah. I saying it's the best map ever? No, but it's an asymmetrical map. And with an asymmetrical map, you're going to have to get you have to think a little bit outside the box when you when you're rotating around the map and not just do the same thing every single time or else you're going to get caught off guard. Other maps you'll have more traditional setups. You could just win an initial, do the same thing pretty often and most likely you'll come out with a W if you have I good had, initial I damage. I had to use so much brain power cast in that map for the first time. <laughs> I was like, what the? Yeah, just sorry about that. that. Didn't I, I, make it so stressful. I, I was just like, what the <laughs> Just like is it a counterclockwise rotation? I'm just trying to figure out the pattern uh, 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 of how everybody's playing, but you know, but once you get it, you know, uh, you know, it was better. I was a little bit better for me to try to. It, it's try definitely to one of the. It's definitely one of the most chaotic maps on the the circuit for sure. You I would I would really love for good. them to change the A, B, and C hill based off the way it is played. You know, just because. I I don't even mind the map the way it is right now, but it's well, funny because mm -hmm. when the map first came out, I actually disliked it heavily, and over o over time, you know, just learning how to play the map. It's it's a map where I do think the better team will win more often than not. There's other maps. I'm not gonna say which ones. But there, there's like two or three maps, and this is why I think like you know having auto bans is really okay for now. But like the maps, the way they're designed, there's a couple of them that just really aren't that good. Mm -hmm. And you can run a really good initial, and you're not going to come out with it, even if you hit all your shots, even if you stick to the plan. So the thing is, is when you have a map with more of like those 50-50 types of initials, you got to be careful what kind of teams you could play that against. You could get away with that against amateur teams, semi-pro teams, some of the lower-ranked pro teams, a like 7th to 8th. 50 but when, initial. 
Yeah, but when you get to initials that are li like, let's say you run a strategy, you Hold know on. what strat they're going to run, yeah. they run it, and you run a quality counter to that strategy, and you do everything right, and you're still not coming out on top, of course you want to blame yourself first. That's the main thing you want to do as a coach, right? I want to go more is, in depth. Look what at what the weaknesses are. But the thing is, is when those 50-50 strategies are coming into each other, and you technically know that you should have the edge, and the way the map design is, everybody's just funneling into one place, and the let's say the options or the adjustments out like after the first part of the initial are very very linear mm -hmm. well then it becomes really easy to read what your opponent's going to do because based off the map they have very limited options you see what i'm saying some other maps that we have right now the the options out of like the first part of the initial you have a lot more things that you can do and when you have that i think that there's you know different looks that you could give and you know nrg does really good in that situations and so does mazer and us and like and ghost and stuff like that but if you take let's say i don't know a low tier top eight team and like the fourth or third best team in the game mm -hmm. and you put them on that 50 50 map let's just say mazer and uh, nrg played on one of them then it can get a little crazy and it's... you can lose control really really fast if you're on one of those maps. Yeah, and, so. I, and so I want to I want to talk I want to take it down a little bit and talk a low level of of the initial, right? And so, folks, when he, yeah. when he's talking about initial, he is saying that the first the initial strategy that a team starts the round with, where they're sending all five players to a designated location in which they got to play, and that typically is based off the spawn position in which they're in, because certain spawns can get to certain key areas of the map before other ones. That's why your initial is so important. But when it comes down to controlling the power weapons along the center line of the map, now, uh, now, Joe, can you just say one more time, like, wh like, what makes it like? Why is it a fifty-fifty, right? Why is it, you know, why, why is it a fifty-fifty across it's the map? 50, why is it so it's, uncertain? It's, 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 it's a 50-50 if everybody has to be flooded into one specific point and there's not many options on how to control the area. You know what I'm saying? Like that, uh, mm -hmm. I'll just give okay. it. Okay, like, 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 like asylum. You want to say asylum? Asylum is, yeah, asy asylum, especially on this current update, is now one of them. But asylum before, asylum before, right, I felt like you had a lot more options of what you could do. The way the movement is right now and how fast it is, if you have a front spawn and you want to go take mid-room, you can just go take mid-room. The only thing that's going to really stop you is if three Lancers are looking at you. On land, two Lancers will probably down you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But online right now, you could possibly even have like a third spawn and a second spawn looking at you. And as you try to run to mid room, and you're probably going to get away with it 70 to 80%, maybe even more percentage of the time. Whereas on the old update, when you didn't have the knife speed boost, when the up base speed boost wasn't as good, when the slip speed for the wall bouncing wasn't buffed like it is now, you couldn't do that. You could have a front spawn go try to take it, and one person look at them, and if you get good shots, then you could stop them right now. So the thing is, is the initials right now are all out of whack. Every team, for the most part, has to completely rework a lot of their initial strategy, which cancels out prep that people have been doing for months, right? And, and that's because of the speed of the game. On that one. It's been really bad because Asylum, we used to have about four or five different initial strats that we could run, okay. mm -hmm. but now we literally are limited down to basically one or two because yeah. of how important map control is and map position is. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, it's like, as an amateur team, at least, if you have a few strats or you make a good call, let's say, for example, you see that there's three or four at B on Asylum, and you're like, all right, let's send their numbers to home. Mm -hmm. With all the boosting that's in the game right now, those players can get a late call at B and still get all the way over to their home oh, yeah. before you make it. And mm -hmm. it's insane. Like It you changes can't... the defensive strategy. It changes the yeah. initial strategy. It, 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 it makes, it, makes it, 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 it takes a massive nerf to, to if you have good setups. It nerfs your setups yeah. now because you can't you can't like for example <laughs> let's let's stick with asylum yeah let's say let's say you have a decent setup and you're in a situation where it's like the middle of the game right let's mm -hmm. say you have a lead let's say the lead is by like I don't know sixty points let's just say it's like one hundred and eighty to one hundred and twenty right you have a base setup and you're trying to hold the middle lane by yourself nowadays you could just fly through the middle lane cut and flank the guy on first half homes get behind him on the east side and there's not really much you could do. Mm -hmm. On land, you might down that guy with a lancer by yourself. Yeah. But online, you're not downing that guy. Yeah. yeah probably yeah. 70, 80 percent no. of the time, he's getting past he you. And, right and, and, he's and close he's that flying gap. past you. And and, so, and, and, and and he gets three. He gets three to four up A's during that time yeah. that he's going that simple route. 
and he's getting boosts every single time. And now those boosts are faster, and he's not just getting a boost with the up A speed boost, yeah. he's also getting a boost with the slip speed. And if you're rise, well, then you're knifing every single one of them too. So now you got That's a little bit extra on top of that. Yeah, and, and so, yeah. And, and, let's, and, and let me say that, uh, and the thing is, is that we, I think we talked about it on the on on last podcast that because of the speed and the, and the ability to be able to close distances, that negates a player being able to make a smart decision and say, I can lock this down with my Lancer right yeah, now. Yeah, it, because it punishes but, smart play. Completely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you know that the smart play typically would be me doing X. But because of the pace, the smart play is me whipping out my shotgun and getting ready for a close-range battle because it's coming, right? And I'm just going to be ready for it because at any given time, he can decide to go straight and I have to defend against the play. But and, and at that level, that becomes the play. And so we so what I'm getting is that we're we're saying that because of the speed of the game, it limits the amount of strategy in which you and the amount of opportunities you have to start the map and play these rounds for success because it limits the opportunities that because the smart play is, you know, it's very few, right? The the most optimal play becomes we all gotta rush this. Well, we all got a wolf pack there, and we all got to throw flashes here, and this is just what it has to be. And, and so that just makes it, like, miserable, honestly, because, like, when Gears 5 first came out, was there a few minor things that people want to update and we got? Well, yeah, like, the marks, for example, got dumbed down, but with this new movement speed, you're technically taking away just all the diversity of mm -hmm. play styles that we had before this update. It yeah, literally we had so much improvement, too. And this is we a good point for and this is a good point for Sky because you know Sky when you were playing and and and, and back on execution days y'all probably had five, ten, five to ten strategies a map in which y'all can pull out of y'all back pocket for any given situation yeah yeah I mean the thing that comes to mind as being the most different I felt as a person who wasn't competing in Gears Four but I watched tournaments and stuff the lack of retake weapons on the map uh, for escalation because there's no generally there wasn't frags and that sort of uh, inks I guess um, on the map and now there's none uh, at all but not having that stuff in the game as like a core mechanic uh, seems like it forces a lot of the fighting at the field um, which to me has made gameplay from Gears 4 on pretty one dimensional from and, and, and meaning that you know we're not they're not starting the, the map with them down Everyone's just flying, yeah, yeah or they yeah. were spawning Marxes or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I haven't seen a meta, and maybe this existed at some point, where retake type stuff was prioritized over either Marxa or more recently drop shots and booms and shit. Mm. Uh, like, yeah, most of the time, that's the biggest missing part of the game. Most of the time in Gears 4, honestly, the way the game was played and the way the meta was played is you just tried your best to always make sure that you were winning the initial. Like, back in our day, when we would play, sometimes that wasn't always necessarily the case. If you didn't come out with the power weapon, if you had map positioning, there were ways to trap people and make it so that if you just went and just went for the power weapon every single time, it's not going to always work out in your favor if you just go for the weapon and then try to get to that base setup, you know? When you were playing Execution, you could have strategies where you would just angle people mm. out, and it was actually a trap if you went for the weapon right away and didn't think about anything else, you know? And now you're losing a lane of coverage, and then all of a sudden you're getting, L, like, L-shaped lancer or you're getting hit by X angles, and you're like, wait, what the hell is going on? And then now your whole strat just went to crap. In Gears 4, that was a thing in UE. You would see a lot of different strategies of initials. Yeah. You would also have kind of an identity to a lot of different top eight teams. Nowadays, when you play Gears 4, it's kind of just, <laughs> and this is also a big reason why I think NRG is good, not taking away from their championships, yeah. of course not, but I'm just saying they're, they're really good because they're good at controlling chaos and chaotic moments in those initial strategies when everybody's in each other's face, right? Yeah. But on a map like Foundation, for example, how many times would you see a team like Echo Fox or Ghost or whoever else may you like trying to angle them out and con doing it consistently off the initial? It didn't really happen. It would just only happen if you started winning the initial after both teams basically collide into each other. You get yeah. a 4v2 or a 4v3, and then you start seeing those angles happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And but you would never see in a 5v5 situation that happen happen often because it's just the way the game is you know there's hills on the map you got to play for yep, the hills yep, yep. and when it when you it comes to the retake weapons 
Yeah, when it comes to the retake weapons that, that Colin is talking about, I mean, for us, when we were on Ghost, we just used drop shot all the time. If we, we, we would do that a few times, like if we knew we were coming out with the drop shot, then we knew no matter what setup that they had that we could break it down. Also, because there was a lot of drop shots in Gears 4 when you got it on the center line. Oh, yeah. But the other weapons that you would use is usually AOE weapons. Sometimes, mm -hmm. like a sniper, an M bar is useful. But timing an M bar and a retake isn't always easy. Timing a yeah. snipe is easier. You just got to hit one headshot. But the AOE weapons are what you can use to like limit people's you know options. And what I mean is like area of effect. So like the shot grenades, grenade and the shot flame, grenades yeah. incense, like weapons like that are very useful in those types of you know situations when you want to limit the opponent's defense yeah. and make sure that they're cut off and they can't help out their teammates. So you can play for one side of the map and, and then I'll, pinch the other. And let me, uh, but, so the, I just want to, I just want to point out something that you said, because, you know, it's something that I, I just thought about. Uh, and, and it's because, you know, back when we were playing beforehand, like every map is, is, is a, everybody's playing for a quick pick of a power weapon for the most part, right? It's quick pick power mm -hmm. weapon, throwing your smokes and your flashes right on top. And, you know, the utility is there to possibly get it and run. But, you know, back in the day, a quick pick was a strategy that wasn't used as often to start around. You know, it's ri it's it, it's it was risky. very it was very risky and rare where people were like, no, we're going to set up 50 yard line. Like, let's say Clock Tower, for example, and we're going to play with our Lancers and our pistols, maybe use a smoke grenade here and there to acquire the power weapon, which will happen about, you know, maybe maybe 40 seconds to 45 seconds to a minute in a round. Now you yeah. get in these power weapon quick hits within like the first 15 seconds of the round because of what you're giving and, 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 and the speed of it all, you know? And so, uh, you know, I, I, I do miss, you know, I, I will say that I do miss, um, you know, the, the, the players coming to the 50 and then stopping, right? I'll, I'll, they, tell, you, I'll tell you what, two things, right? First mm -hmm. one, going off of what you're saying, on, imagine like a perfect example one that makes me think about it uh, is canals imagine yep. just going and picking up torque bow every single round and getting away with it yeah especially especially when your opponent has nade control on mid bridge mm -hmm. that's not gonna happen like you could get it like i played bow i li that literally that was my job yep. most of the time on tk was getting bow and getting out we would if, if we played a six round seven round game like i'm not running that strat more than twice and it was like, gonna be hard no because way. the snipers because, exactly because where once they get game. if they get if they get nades and they're weapon sliding it correctly especially online and snipers looking at him he's not getting the headshot they're just gonna blind fire those nades right over the top throw them behind us and then yeah maybe one round we push through and we get away with it because snipes looking at nades but realistically you get punished if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and get the top team and like and, and, a map like and so but if, ahead, you were to, if you were to set up but that's the thing is that and if you were to, you know, go and then set up on that map, the thing is about retakes that Skyla said, and this is why I've always been an advocate of a slower game, because the what teams had to do to retake position and to get numbers, those plays that they came up with were fucking beautiful, all right? And it, yeah. was, it was so creative. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what I want. And now it, it, it still happens. But sometimes it happens at a faster pace for the average eye to catch, right? And that's where yeah, I sometimes I mean, make the big bucks trying to just translate that right away. But I want the audience to be able to, to see that unfold at a slower level always. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, the difference between drop shot rolling someone out versus a frag grenade, like, the timing of that sequence is about twice as fast. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, yeah, I made the person move, and then everyone focuses or whatever. Um hmm. Instead, it's usually the drop shot getting the kill now, so it's different. It is. Different. It just, it, it just, it just <laughs> so, it, it, it's so much faster, and it's, it's also so much more chaotic. Like right now, I would say the the main reason why I like the last update so much better than this one. I mean, of course, like it pays into you know my team's favor because we're a more methodical type of team. But in regards to just even for the viewers, like. You want the viewers to be able to understand what's going on. Like, I have friends. I'm not even trashing Gears 5 in any way, shape, or yeah. form right now. Trust me, because I want to see it grow, and I want to see it improve. But I have friends that I used to play, like, Gears 1 with, Gears 2, 3, Gears 2, Gears 3 with, like, close friends of mine that I grew up with and either worked my first job with them or I went to school with them. And they're telling me, they're like, Joe, I'm sitting here, and I'm watching Escalation, and it's so fast. 
I can't even tell when you guys are making a good or a bad play most of the time anymore. <laughs> yep. And I'm serious. And they're actually saying that. And these are guys, these are not new viewers. These are mm-hmm. not guys who haven't played the game before. These are guys who have, you know, have played game it. battles, done pretty well. They have experience with multiple Gears titles. And they're saying, like, Joe, I'm trying to keep up. And, like, I'm so happy when you guys win rounds and stuff. But I can't even tell when it's a good play or when it's a bad play. And that's something that... That I think, like, you know, the casters need to really try to, like, you know, get on and stuff yeah. like that. But also, at the same time, it's not even just the caster's job. It's more so TC's job to slow down the game so it's more understandable. Mm-hmm. Look at Counter-Strike. Is Counter-Strike a super fast game? No. no. You know what I'm saying? It's not. And and you could understand the intricacies of when people make a really good play or they make a really bad play. Yeah. And on the last update... I felt like the reason the game was really exciting at San Diego and really exciting going into San Diego was because the game was slower. For example, other than the initial damage situations we were talking about in setups or in initials that are kind of ruined now and severely nerfed due due to the update, Mm -hmm. the other major thing... um, Wow, I just lost my train of thought. It's going to come back to me in a second. Initials that... Oh, yeah. So let's. it's also microspacing. So this is something I, I preach to you know, my team all the time is like your individual spacing when you're in like one-on-one situations, Mm -hmm. right? So I break it down into like percentages. So let's say, for example, let's use Asylum as an example. You know, like the up A that when you're going from uh, like, we call it Bell. It's like the bottom side going up towards E. So like the bottom of that staircase going Mm -hmm. to E. The one that's like not in the corner, but the one that's a little bit closer to the middle, that up A. Let's say you're defending that up A with a right-hand advantage and your spacing's good. So let's say you're three feet away from the wall, four feet away from the wall, maybe a little bit more. And you have someone that's literally weak. Like let's say they're 60% damaged already, Mm -hmm. maybe even 70% damaged. If you're holding your shot, and you hit one shot as they approach the wall, and you hit the second shot as they go for the up A, they are not going to reaction shot you. It's just not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Right now, with how crazy the speed is, sometimes online, I don't even think the net code can keep up with what's happening because there are situations where, like, I'll, I'll use uh, Nick as an example. Um, like, Nick's in a one-on-one in that specific situation online. On land, it's easier to get the kill. And he'll literally brick the kid two times. He hits the wall up A's after we already have initial damage. He's at 97%. He power shots Nick and just kills him in one shot from really deep. You know what I'm saying? That shouldn't be a thing. That that takes away from, like, the, the, the natural meta and the strategy of Gears. Like, that takes away from the micro spacing of Gears. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I look at it and I analyze it, in Gears 1, I felt like you had to overcompensate you know, maybe you lose 10%, 15% of, like, your microspacing, you know what I'm saying, because you're playing online. Gears 2, I would say, you know, you or Gears 2 or 3, I would say maybe you lose a little bit more. Gears 4, I would say you lose 20 to 25%. But right now with how bad it is, bro, I'm not even kidding, I would even stretch it to say, like, 30% to 40% of your microspacing is, like, flawed right now because of the way the game is online. And, yes, on land it will be a little bit less, but it's still going to be a huge issue. And that's why they have to balance the this movement because it's going to affect not even just the, the close range combat situations with microspacing but like I said it will also affect initial strategy with initial damage in initials and it will also affect yeah. it in setups and that's taking away a lot of the competitive integrity of what makes Gears of War special to me it's, and what I believe it also makes it special to many other people that it, have competed for many years yeah and what, what made strategy so awesome and why the speed boost stuff is and why like having different ways of getting these speed boosts in certain areas is the issue uh is because every you as a player you understand the timings of every spawn because the amount of reps in which you play gears right and that yeah. timing is sacred when it comes down to strategy and how can you buy yourself an extra second or how can you now you know, utilize your nades to block off a certain area because you know the front spawn takes six seconds to get here. You Six seconds. It takes you three seconds to get the nade. You know that within a second, you have to hit the cutoff at this point, right? Those were the type of plays in which we had to make because that was the consistency in which we had, and that's why we kind of always wanted to have locked spawns in because I forgot which... You remember what was Gears 2? The Gears 2 was the, was the first game where we had the random spawns, and then we had to, like, we were trying to figure out the system of how it works, but it came down to multiple players having to kind of play those positions. Or when we, or I remember some strategies we came up with, and the guy was like, oh my God, I got the first spawn this round, and we'll run a certain strategy. Uh, and because yeah. some rounds, some player would not get that spawn. And so we had to, 
in order for us to get more consistency as a team, we had to another, add another layer to our strategy. But it really, it was a on an inconsistent system. And then w- one other thing that we had lost was uh, as we get faster and everybody having to do all these different roles and stuff, is that we lose the players used to take a lot of pride in being the best with nades, being the best sniper, you know, being a, the, you know, the best in, in a given position. And, you know, we were able to, you know, to put them up on the pedestal a lot easier. And I feel like now it's just you either a slayer or you a support. You know what I'm saying? That's basically all it comes down to now. And the craziest part about this whole movement update, like I, I can use myself as an example. I mean, first off, like, Joe said there's methodical teams out there and I'm a methodical player myself. Like that's one of the reasons why I absolutely love this franchise. Cause I feel like it's a shooter that you have to think so deeply about in order to succeed in. But I felt like part of that integrity, of course, with the movement update has changed. But I mean, me as an example, when this game first came out, when it was a little bit slower and everything and the whole pacing was slower, I had lower sensitivity than I did on Gears 4. Mm -hmm. I do play Claw, but I also play just default. And Mm -hmm. with this movement update and with all the things that are, like, kind of messed up with the overall game, like the overall input lag that happens, things of that nature, I've now had to retrain my brain and play as a defaultinate god, basically, just to try to fight people. And So you were forced to change your play style because it was the smartest thing to do? Yeah, but, like, that's the thing. It's, like, I have to literally try to change who I am just to match where the game's going, even though from at least all the feedback we've heard from the esports player, it's gone a wrong direction. But in order to, like, keep up with the chaos and madness, yeah, I've had to switch my play style a bit just to do that, which leads me into a situation where I do not make as smartest plays as I used to. It punishes me a lot, and it just becomes a problem. And you think about if that's like one player like me, you got to imagine how many other amateurs had had to do some type of changing or some type of control remapping or just Mm -hmm. rethink their brain. And then another thing that's been happening in the amateur community since San Diego is when we went out there, you did have the more methodical players playing inside the bracket. You might have had a few open bracket teams that were more head down warriors that got cooked because they were going against teams that have proper Lancers and proper ideas for land. But now what we're seeing, which is good and bad, is in the weekly PGL tournament, we're around 35 teams right now, which is a little bit higher than before we went to San Diego. But there is a huge significance of teams that are now in the overall tournaments that are literally head down warriors from four, because the newest update made them extremely relevant again. Because even if I play as smart as I can and I have the right call again, I'm usually going to bulldoze over because someone can slip speed, knife speed up A to me Mm -hmm. before I can even think about, oh, well, we got to do this. Like, I'm already was saying with the whole cover fight with Nick as an example. It's really created not only chaos, but again, in my mind, it just creates to where now you're forcing your player base to have to play that like one or two specific styles, even yeah. what you said, Blaze, support or slayer. There's no like methodical thinking. It's really hard to be a flex now because if you try to flex, you're either gonna fly through the seam or you're gonna get caught. And it's just but, but support insanity, players can never really even truly be you know just fully support in a sense, you know? Because now yeah. the game based off of the con- the consistency of certain in order to have more consistency as a squad, every player ends up having to play any given position based off kind of where they are on the map, right? It's a lot of yep. quick quick change in, in, in what's happening. Uh, and, you know, hence, you know, we saw teams get built around that and just picking up five slayers and have a lot of success, right? You get a lot of talented players and they just, you know, go out there and win off skill and not have to, you know, do too much high-level thinking. And, I mean, uh, I think it's right on the change. Go ahead, Scott. What was your like, question? Do you feel the change actually caused most of these things, or do you think it just exacerbated some of them? Because to me, like I, all the things you guys are describing have been the case since like years four. Yeah, I, I would say like even for myself, right? And this happened to me during uh, Gears Three before like I I got into UE and made like a comeback. I remember I had to switch to playing Claw. That was like something you just had to do because Gears Three was just naturally a much faster paced game then Gears 1 was, and then Gears 2 was, right? So, like, Ribs taught me how to claw. And I felt like at the time back then, 
that was about as far as you needed to change it, like your own gameplay, right? If you yeah, just switch from a, default to, to claw, that. Yep. that would be that would be a really big advantage, right? Like I remember Nick Merckx did an interview when I was playing on TK, and he was like, "What the hell? Like, why has like Joe improved so much?" And and he was like, "Oh, was it Jordan? Yeah, Jordan was a big part of it, but the biggest part of it was definitely switching to claw." Nowadays, as a coach. I could tell you right now that my guys, I've had guys that have switched from default to either default in it or default um, to alternate. Alternate's really popular too. But at the pro in the pro scene, you usually see at least at least two to three players that are alternate players or default in it players on practically every single team. Or else, if they don't do that, they can't even keep up on initial strategy. They won't get to a spot fast enough. They'll literally get to a spot too slow be at a disadvantage off the initial if, they, if they're if they trying to, you know, go for that 50-50 type of fight we talked about on certain maps where the map literally forces you at times to play that way. So, yeah, we see we see a lot of people now that literally feel like they have to play that fast play style all the time. And then also with the commentators, most of the commentators, they don't even make it um, known that when you're clutching up, it's because, like, everything else went wrong. Your initial went wrong. You know what I'm saying? Post initial went wrong. Mm -hmm. Somebody had bad microspacing in this spot. That's why he died. And now this one guy's in a 1v3 and he clutches up and we act like he's, you know, Jesus. Yeah. Like, it's it, the thing is, is yes, he made a really good play. We definitely should give him some praise for that. Yeah. But we should also be asking him what happened on the initial. Did he leave too early? Or did he and, screw his teammates over? Like, and, there, there's there's certain questions that yeah. we should be asking, and, and those questions don't get asked. And that's because literally we focus so much on being able to get a two three a two piece or a three piece all the time. And don't get me wrong, it's it, very it, it requires a lot of talent to be mm -hmm. able to do that. It you does know require what I'm a lot of talent. I just want to say in the talent, but, in the talent's defense that. We were watching from a from a certain lens of you know front spine. It was a lot of smokes down. You know, it's been a lot of spectator changes and adjustments to be able to see how everybody has had plays off the initial. You know what I'm saying? I, so I just want to put that out there that that was even difficult sometimes, and everything happened so fast where that you got to ask yourself, you know, which part was relevant and what did we miss here and there. But you know, I, I do agree that that needs to be translated a little bit better sometimes so people and then, understand. And then to go off of that, right, like even to go off of that, like in in more detail, like on the last update, the reason the reason why I feel like the last update was also so good is because I finally felt like, wow, like I'm starting to see way more out of not even just my own players, but also other teams when I'm studying other teams. I'm seeing a guy that's a, more of a flex player on homes mm -hmm. shine a little bit more because now when he's playing the game correctly, he's getting rewarded for it. Perfect example. Let's use someone like uh, like Jerpy, mm -hmm. right? Like Jerpy's one of those guys. He might not communicate, you know, like an IGL or like or, or like a or like a really good co-leader, but he's really good at naturally holding his lane, resetting and playing smart, right? Yeah. So guys like that on the old update, we will see them shine a lot more. I could almost guarantee you a player like him is gonna get you know, situations where he should win the one-on-one -on -one fight, then now he's losing his home because of it, you know, because of the way the update currently is. And things like that, just they're not good for competitive integrity. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. then on top on top of that, having the diff having like like a war between people who prefer like the old style, the old like the methodical way of playing, like let's say it's the insanes, mm -hmm. the reciprocity, um, like the the retaliation if you go back in the day, those types of teams, it's awesome when you see them playing the game like that where they could play the game the way they want. And then when you see the other types of teams, you have like the NRG, you have the Mazer, you have the Rise and whoever else you want to say. If you want to go back in the day, you could say it's Infinity or whatever, or maybe the old version of Optic. Yeah. Those games that thrive in chaotic environments. I don't want us to have a game personally where only one of those types of teams is able to thrive consistently you know what i'm saying i want the game where both types of those teams can thrive consistently and then sometimes we'll eventually see some type of hybrid between those types of play styles you know what i'm saying yep. and so that, that think... and, then, and then also seeing different types of players too like what you guys are saying right now sorry to cut you off by the way i think that was right, <laughs> um but but um when you're seeing these different types of players right like you guys are saying earlier that it seems like it's only just slayer or only support but what's funny 
is when I even analyze my own team, I don't think of them that way. I feel like IG, I feel like Fran is my in-game leader that specializes in preparation, and then on top of that is really good at, at playing either Flex, Slayer, or can even go into a power weapon role. So I feel like he's just mm -hmm. a very versatile guy, one of my vers most versatile on my team. I have rushes and I have powers who are my, who are my you know, power weapon player, like uh, not power weapon, uh, Slayers, yeah. but they're also versatile with different types of weapons, right? The yeah. weapons I would give to Rush are not anywhere near the, we the weapons I would give to, to power right yeah and then i have kenny who is a very very skilled flex and he could play multiple different roles and he specializes in defense and then i have icy who's a veteran and does a little bit of both and then he also specializes with power weapons i felt like on the last up and i could do that for any team like analyzing them a little bit you know more than just slayer and support yeah um just from watching them so much but the thing is is when we see the game like each player broke it down like that and then we could have the game a little bit slower so where we could see that from multiple different teams, like the ex-Ghost roster now known as the Pittsburgh Knights, or, for example, like NRG, Mazer, you know, all these types of guys, like all these teams that are so different from each other. You know, that's what we want to be able to talk about and then be able to break down the initials of why these initials are going their way or why they're not they're going their, you know, their way on a more, I guess, like detailed analytical scale, if that makes sense. And, I mean, to me, like, nuance change. Or you think it's a sweeping change that gets you to that point? Say that. Hold on. Say that again. Yeah, yeah. You, you, talk, you put, your mic, put your mic a little nuance? bit closer. You think they can be accomplished through a nuance change, or do you think that they're pretty far off from being able to have that? I actually think I uh, here's the thing. Honestly, like where TC's at with the game right now, I feel like they did make a lot of really good changes, and I felt like they were closest to that on the last update. The last update that we were playing on going into San Diego before they changed it really um, at the event, I felt like was the close I ever felt. I didn't really yeah. feel that way in Gears 4. Gears 4, I just felt like more of what you guys said. I just had slayers. I had support players. You know, I would preach to them those types of correct roles, but those roles wouldn't really happen all the time. Nowadays, like, um, I think that the last update we were on before this one was the closest we were at. And also, I know that the casual community has a very different perspective than maybe I have or other people have on what they believe the game should be. And I understand why they like fast-paced gameplay, especially if most of them are usually playing free-for-all and stuff like that. I get why they want the fast pace. Mm -hmm. But the only thing I would say to those types of players is even though, like, first of all, like, I don't think that myself or any of the other guys that are in the esports, like, have an ego with, like, the way we like like to play it's just we're analyzing the gameplay for what it is to us at the highest level a competing it's just math right yeah. like that's just how we look at the game and then when it comes down to how they want the game i already feel like that the competitive community has made lots of effort to like you know i guess be willing to change yeah you know? no, and no, 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 have, yeah and be willing to have and be willing to have a faster <laughs> pace game and be willing to sacrifice you know and allowing wall bounce canceling and then allowing all these different things to happen where Sky that's, a part that's of one sacrifice uh, like, like there, there's a lot of sacrificing that's come from the competitive community on the way the just, game hey, is remember, now. Remember Gears Three, and, I, and, I, and just Gears Three, that when we were when the game first dropped, right after the we're a little bit after the beta, we were all deciding as a community, do we do we go off on our own way and just change all the weapon swaps on every map because they were bad, and the maps would have been better with better weapons in the right areas, or yeah. do we play the game that everybody else is playing with the one shot and the mortar? And, and, and in hopes to bring the entire community together that we all play the same game and we can get more people to eSports. So we've been thinking yeah. in that mindset for years. How do we get to this point? But it's only so far you can go. I feel, like, I feel like the last update was like a fair compromise. I felt like it was a fair compromise for the casuals, and I also felt like it was a fair compromise for the competitive community. The game is still fast. You still can get to places very quickly. It's just that if you, you have to understand, if you're playing against a very experienced mm -hmm. team and two Lancers are looking at you in one lane, that, that microspace for you is not good, buddy, unless you're absolutely forced at the end of the round to have to make that play in escalation. That's probably not the play, and you probably should communicate to another lane to try to get an angle on those people that are angling you out. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it just, you have to, you have to look at, you have to look at it as, just because you want to play aggressive doesn't mean it's supposed to work out for you every time. You got to kind of weigh in all the different things that are happening on the map and really ask yourself, okay, is there something we as a team could have done different there? It's, but for casuals, I understand that's not the it's case hard for them, them to even because understand. they're playing alone all the time. Yeah, and it's hard, but it's hard, but it's hard for the for the game to even give them enough consistency for them to understand the patterns in which they should yeah. be looking for, right? 
And that's yeah. when that's and then what... it comes down to the matchmaking too, right? Like at the same time, like it's not like we're we're blessed enough to where we have so many people playing that we could run some type of true scale matchmaking and stuff like that. Like we don't have a big enough player base to be able to do that, right? So it's like it it, it it's tough. But I just felt like the last update was the fairest compromise we've ever had, and I think that's why the competitive community is so um, like strung up on getting back to that because it was the best we've seen gears of war not only look but feel from an esports perspective in a very long time mm -hmm. but i also feel like the game is more than fast enough especially when you're talking about playing alternate or playing default alternate or playing on all 30s like you still have your speed it's not like we're turning you from the flash into like you know uh like the blob from x-men yeah. or something like that or you lover. know what i'm saying it's not like we're making you that slow you still have a lot of options of what you could do with your character yeah, I think it's interesting that you kind of see the casual community as people that want it fast. Uh, they do. Like, yeah, on the forums but, all the time. I actually read it a lot. I think you're actually talking about the, I, I call them like the core community, I guess. Um, yeah, it's fair. There's more of them than yeah. there is of us, of but course. You, but... Yeah, but, but I'd say even underneath that layer, there's probably the masses, which are the actual casual players that are stumbling around against bots mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. or spending their time in Horde or, or whatever. Um, I imagine that that group is actually larger than the core plus competitive combined, and I imagine that their preference is actually towards slower, um, which is... Oh yeah, some I would definitely agree it's towards slow. The other argument, well, I won't go too deep into this one, because this is a little bit of a different perspective than most people have, but I used to always say that when I would, like, and obviously people are going to say, oh, Joe, that's just because you like Gears 1. But, yeah, there's a little bit of truth to that, but it's not even, like, the whole piece of the mm -hmm. pie. I would say that um, I always thought center screen for the community mm -hmm. was way better than I thought um, Barrel mm -hmm. was. And the reason why, and, and, and I'm going to say this for a couple reasons. The first reason why I always thought center screen was better is I always remember when I was a casual and I had no idea what the hell I was doing, mm -hmm. at least I always knew where my shot was going. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's center that's, screen. That's, that's, that's how you learn how to wall bounce on gears and hit shots. Yeah. You know where the center yes. was. Yeah, so you always knew where the center was. And nowadays, if you're a casual, right, like, Scott, you're talking about those people that are, like, not technically, like, like beneath the casuals, right? The people who actually would love a slower game because they don't play super fast like that and maybe they're not as active on the forums. Those types of players, I think, would love center screen. And the other Are we barrel uh, shooting right now, yeah? What's up? Are we, we're barrel shooting right now, right, in Gears 5? We're barrel shooting, yeah. So, yeah. like, and then, and then the, the other group of people that I think would totally help Based out Based off the playstyle, you probably wouldn't even need to know. You know, you got to get close up to somebody anyway to get a kill. <laughs> yeah, it's just, well, well, the really, the really talented know. players nowadays, they're all really, really good at barrel, and most of them come from the Gears 3 underground area, or if they don't come from there, it's the Gears 2 underground area and all that stuff. But the thing is with barrel is barrel is a lot harder to learn, even for me, like someone who played for a long mm -hmm. time. It took me a little bit before I was like, okay, I feel like I know where my shots are going because I play warm-ups against my players every single day. Like, all the time. I'm always playing them for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, sometimes longer if they're online a little bit earlier, you know, before we go over VODs and stuff. And when I'm playing against them, of course, like, even though I don't play anymore, I'm going to take it serious and I'm going to try to make sure yeah. I'm getting better just in case, God forbid, I had to ever sub in one day. I don't want to suck, you know? So the thing is, is, like, center screen to me, I felt like you see the, the different types of play styles more. The game was naturally a little bit slower. Um, and on top of that, I think it's also huge for all the big streamers to get into it. Yeah. If you had center screen, High Distortion's playing that game. Nick Merckx is playing that game. Dr. Disrespect would probably be more inclined to try to play that bro, game. Bro, bro. You know what I'm saying? We were, like, so, like, we were so close to having, like, these 10-man gangster streamer lobbies with some of the yes. biggest names yeah. out there, and they were having fun playing Gears. Yeah, the, yeah. The Doc, like, Doc Nick, CDN, Red Camille's, whoever yeah, just playing everybody, Execution everybody. every day going crazy. Gears, yeah. Gears would have had so... We would have had so much. So many viewers there. And, 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 and uh, you know, and I will say that... Um, you think center screen gets us there? You think the center but, but, screen? But you, but, I think, but, I'm not saying center well, screen gets us all the way there. Doesn't, but doesn't get it, us all the way there. <laughs> but, but what I was gonna, what I was just gonna say is that I uh, will fade. Let me just say, your, finish your point real quick. And I go. Well, what I well, all, all I'm trying to say is like, I'm not saying center screen gets us all the way there, right? I'm just saying that center screen is one of those things, right? As, as someone who's, you know, played all the different iterations, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I know some, well, some of my teammates agree with me completely too. And they say it too. Um, Fran being one of them, I know he's always said that like center screen would be really good for the game. 
But the thing is, is on top of it being good for the game, it also, it's not even just about bringing in the views from all the big streamers, right? That's mm -hmm. huge. That really helps. That, like, that yeah, is you'll huge. Get the like butters. Is... It's huge. It really, they love it really it. They would love help. They're Gears fans. I, 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 know, I know that if the game was on the speed of the last update and we had center screen and then we also had a good matchmaking system on top of it, I think we'd be much more inclined to getting those players into the game, right? But the other thing I would say is that I also think it's huge for the new players, how think think about to when you first started, right? Like mm -hmm. my first time I started playing Gears was back in like years one, and I remember the reason I got into competitive was because in late 2006 or very early 2007, I ended up fighting against the Insanes with this one guy who was my rival in matchmaking. We happened to team up, and he ended yeah. up being my first like person I won a tournament with. And we were teaming together, and we played the Insanes. They start angling us out. Mm -hmm. Literally, like we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. We would beat them in shotgun fights, ironically, because they ended up being world champions. But they would also out-lancer us, out-rotate us, out-strategize us, and we would have these crazy good matches against them, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like if it's center screen, it's easier for newer people to get into the game and a big part of gears right now with how complex barrel shooting can be at times is you don't know where your shot goes how many mm -hmm. times are you on barrel shooting and you're like this guy is right in my face why am i not getting the kill and on gears of war with center screen before the two main things that people had problems with right one of them was backpacking but backpacking still happens right now so that doesn't that doesn't you know it doesn't really matter because it right. happens in both types yeah. right but the other thing is that the bullet spread was random back then. Do, don't you remember? It wasn't always cut like in the same exact place of center when it was the shotgun, like the like the pellets. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't always the same. If we had the pellets always going in the same place, and it was I center? do think that it would help. And I yeah, if it was always center and the and the shotgun spread was always like the same, it wasn't like slightly changing. I think that could help. I'd but obviously. There's other things that are more important, like yeah, matchmaking yeah, yeah, yeah. is much more important. Yeah. Movement is more important. I'm not saying center screen is the end all be all, yep. but I'm just saying it's a, it's a, it's a it's a area of um like a talking point that people just don't talk as much nowadays. Mm -hmm. and I just think it's one of those things that should be talked about. Just well, a little bit, I, it could I would help. agree with I would agree with there, but like let me ask you this really quick. No, no, you you skipped a little bit, Jib. You agree with what? Oh, I agree with what Joe just got done okay. saying with center screen. I think how that would help. But I think the one thing that worries me is recently, this last title update, they just did another like minor Nasher change. But do you think that the Nasher honestly needed any type of changing for this update? Or do you think that how I think, which is when they did the movement speed update, that that really goofed up a lot of the weapons in a way? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I completely agree with you. Uh, on the last update, the movement being severely changed definitely affected the Nasher and definitely affected the netcode. I think that when they're going to look at the Nasher, I don't think there's any point of looking at I, I, I question sometimes how TC prioritizes certain things. Like, I I'm feel not like saying, they're double downing on an issue I, that doesn't even need to be an issue if they, you know, looked back at their notes and they were like, hey, look, the Nasher was registering this update ago, but now it's not. What has yeah, changed? The Nasher was like, fantastic before. Sense. It, it, was, it was literally fantastic before on the last update. So, I mean, if I gave TC any type of feedback, you know, directly or on stream, I would just say, you know, make sure your ego's not in it. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong. Like, mm -hmm. I tell our teammates all the time because we're working in a team environment, right? And when we're working with TC and working with the casual community and, and all the different types of players, you know, that yeah. have such different mindsets on how things should be done. I don't really care about who is right. Like if I bring up a point and no one agrees and that mm -hmm. we don't go that direction, my ego is not going to take a hit because of that. I don't really care. I just care that we get to the solutions, we solve them quickly, and we prioritize correctly when we're fixing the game, right? So yep. what I question about TC is I'm like, okay, guys, like, you know, you obviously know that you made a lot of big movement changes. You know for a fact mm -hmm. that the strafing – you know, was changed, but a lot of other things were changed that you didn't tell us about. You have to keep in mind that, yes, San Diego was very entertaining, but that was before everybody knew how to abuse all this stuff. Yeah. We go into Mexico now, it's and you want to have, and you want to have a really, and you want to have a really good show, you know what I'm saying? You need to fix the movement. Like, well, well, you can well, fix the on all you what want. What happens is the timing of that, because as, as the Pro League starts on Sunday, and then next thing you know, what you do four or five weeks again, and then it's the same thing as the last event but where a big change I'm gonna comes be honest. in the last two weeks. I'm going to be super honest with you. I don't even care about the pro league that much. And I'm not trashing the pro league by any mm -hmm. means. The pro league is important. You know what I'm saying? It is much better practice than a scrim. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But the thing is, is at the end of the day, 
there's not that much money in it, not being, you know, ungrateful for how much, you know, money is in it. Yeah, you know, I am grateful, but it's, it's, it, it's just, it, yeah, it's just, when we compare that to what's going down at land and competing for over $200,000, mm -hmm. like it's completely different. I would much rather that the online pro league takes a little bit of a hit and that the, the land event is the main thing that we're working about making sure we protect that yep. tournament's integrity because that's what really matters, right? That's when everybody's mm -hmm. in person. That's when everyone's on land. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah. want to make sure that that is balanced, right? right. So, And we want to make sure it's working properly. So the main thing I would tell C TC is it's okay to be wrong sometimes. I'm wrong when mm -hmm. I work with our team. There's players on my team who don't mind admit being wrong. And if we want to make progress, it's okay to have a point of view and it's not the most optimal one. And then someone else comes up with an idea and you admit, you know what? That idea for the long run would work better for everyone in Gears of War. And like I said, how hard can it be to revert two numbers? We're not talking about changing the whole movement. We're talking about lowering the slip speed that it takes to wall bounce to a wall. And we're talking about lowering the speed but, boost that you get Joe, from an up A speed boost and then canceling the knife. But That's Joe, it. but Joe, it's yeah. split. Okay? What's the it's, opinion? Hold on, I know. Hold on, hold on, but let me let me say let me say this though. Okay, I'm just, I'm just being a little uh, extra. Uh, but you know, granted, you know, as they say, oh, the community is split. Some want fast, the other one slow. Now, I'm, I'm you know, what it comes down to for me is that, you know, I think about all the years in which we played Gears and and how the pace of the game affected it at, a, at the highest competitive level. And we hope that, and, and if you have a multiplayer, you hope every multiplayer you game is at the highest competitive level because it's, it's multiplayer, right? Unless yeah. you're playing PvE. Any version of PvP you play, you want everybody to play at the highest competitive level. And, you know, one of the beauties about just Gears 1 was the high, medium, low. Everybody played on high. You didn't have no boost. And everybody understood the timings. And we had a lot of great-ass Gears players back then. But where it all, like, kind of changed. And where this is my issue is that the players who want a faster Gears game and who love that pace don't know any better. They don't know better. No, they, don't. they don't know don't. better. They're because the in they don't. Yeah, cause, because in Gears 3... When we had 20 sensitivities, right? Because this is my thing is, is that when they upped everything, it was really off no data. You know, like when, when all the movement speeds got increased, I want to know what was the logic behind it? Because we do know, and the story is a true story of, you know, Carson's and Pete Nub at Hype 2. And Carson's is like, hey, man, let's just put 30 sensitivities in gears. And Pete's like, and bet, just did it. bet, let's and do then, it. And, and he then, did and it, then, right? And then, and then, and then and everybody then quit and everybody stopped playing. And then you had a new generation of gears players just playing gears three off on the side. Epic gets rid of the game. Somebody new picks it up. It's all community stuff. The game is not getting no updates, no support. But now you have these new gears players who are playing something different than what it used to be, and you don't have anyone, very few people of the old, to be able to kind of, you know, make that comparison. So, yeah, these players kind of want a faster game here and there, but my thing is, have they literally, have they really understood and played a slower tactical Gears game and then tell me that that's what they want? And I don't, I, I don't think that the people who are still around even had that experience. And as Sky said, some of the ones who just... It's, I think it's a, another back end of players that don't even go to the forums and stuff, and they just like, yeah, this is different. You know, I want something, you know, a little bit more tactical, gory. You know, I want to be able to play a, a cover shooter, a third person shooter, or something like that. And uh, and, 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 and yeah, and, and that's my that's my that's my biggest issue. And every time I look back on it, I'm just like, but they don't know better. Have you gave them anything to try? Have you gave them a developer's playlist, something on the side where they play something that is just extremely different than what they've had over the last four years. Yeah. And, and the, sad, and the sad thing probably, is... Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, the closest that we probably got with the newer generation, so to speak, playing anything that's slower was the remastered version of UE. But even then, that was a, still a little bit faster than the days of old when we were with the original trilogy. And I honestly... I'm trying to think back because it's been years, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I feel like years one and two... That, that quality of slowness was exactly the perfect way to go. Like, you had to be tactical. You had to think strategical. If you messed up any one little second of where you had to move, yeah. rotate with that speed, you were going to get cooked. And, and you, you understood why. That. And you understood why and how to, how to do it differently next time, too.
Exactly, and now we're on this new generation where you're just forced, like, to, forced, to, forced to run at each other just over <laughs> and over, just coming Here's at it like mid map. Here's a question for you guys, though. Do you feel like, and I'm being completely honest, like, do you, do you feel like we've reached that point of no return where it's like, kind of like, I gotta, feel, I gotta be very careful with how I use this analogy because I don't want to sound like <laughs> degrading to certain types yeah, of players yeah, yeah, at all I'm because I'm not thinking Take that your way. time. <laughs> but think about it. I'm I'm really I'm really trying to word it carefully because I don't want to get Man, cooked on the it, forums it, like no, really it, bad. Like, I ain't but yeah. the best way I could think about it is like if you give like a certain type of food to a human being, right, mm -hmm. and it tastes really really good, right, but it's not good for you, and you don't know it's not good for you yet. You know what I'm saying? You're not educated about it, but you just want to consume it just because you know it tastes you're not, you're not really conscious. good. You feel good. You feel good after it. And you're not being fully, truly conscious about all the repercussions of eating that type of what food. Right? Let's just say it's fast food, whatever. Right? Like, think about it. Like, are we at the point of no return though? Is it like not even going to be possible to go back to a gears mm. like one, uh -huh. two, or three type of play style? Like, because that's what I think. I personally believe that the community has been conditioned so much for so long with you know, this type of gameplay that is so fast, and now they're like, oh my god, I could play free-for-all, and I could play mm. TDM and King of the Hill by myself, and I can get so many kills on my own, and I don't need anybody's help. Like, and you know what I, I mean? Have they I wall experienced bounce that faster, for so long? I think I'm a good player because I wall bounce fast and I hit exactly. shots. Ex That's my ex value exactly. of myself as a Gears player. Exactly. Like that. When I analyze the community, and I look at them, and I see how they talk, and I, I've been reading the forums more lately. I've been looking at Kenny's posts and seeing how people talk in there, and there's some people with really level heads in there and there's some people that it's just you could tell if you were their teammate it's their way or the highway and they're not going to want to work with you on this one it's just they're getting what they want and they're going to cry and scream until they get what they want you know and i don't want the competitive community to look like that because i don't think that's how we are i just think it came down to a point where when we switched from the last update a lot of people including myself drew a line in the sand yeah. and we were like hold on we've been we've been switching it up for years and willing to you know compromise for years now on many different things and we've switched many different years of war games in multiple ways whether it was execution or it was king of the hill or it was even like weapon swaps mm -hmm. or, and now escalation and all these different things we're willing to change to try to come up with one weapon tuning so everybody can get along but look at the games where people did get along the most recent time in my opinion was ue I'm not saying Yui is a perfect Gears game because it's nowhere near, right? No, but, but as a community, what, we had we were, as a community, we played that game Nick Merckx was day. streaming it. We played Nick that Merckx game was streaming it. Day. High Distortion was streaming it. Cream was streaming it. CDN was streaming it. Camille's was streaming it. Requiem was playing it. Everybody was playing it. So the thing is, is like Yui. Literally, you had so many different types of players enjoying it. So mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, like. People still clearly like it. I'm not saying that we have to make a replica of that game. I'm not saying we got to go back to Gears One, even though, of course, you know, I would have no complaint about that. Oh, yeah, of but course. The, the, I think the, like, I'm just, I, but I'm just saying, like, if we could find somewhere in the middle, like between where we are now and where we were then, damn, it would be so much fun. Like, even for me, like as a player, I enjoy playing UE. I don't enjoy playing escalation does that mean escalation isn't good no it's just i i've been around for a long time and it's yeah. just not my cup of tea but yeah. i love i love coaching escalation though i actually love it i love the challenge i love seeing all five screens helping my teammates like on the fly it just it's a whole new way i look at the game and and i was always the type of guy when i used to play that i was kind of a slow learner like i didn't place pro right away when i first started it took me a little bit i had to i had to learn and then i was one of those teammates though and it was kind of like a double-edged sword that was always very very critical of my teammates and although i was critical about myself i wasn't doing it verbally in front of them right and when you do that it can make you look like a hypocrite if you don't catch yourself right so the thing is is i don't know man it's just i think that going back to the old update in regards of movement i don't think that's that big of a sacrifice for everyone else and it would be nice if they noticed a lot of the different sacrifices we've been trying to make oh. to also cater to them because we do uh, keep them in mind though. that's irrelevant so i know you, it probably is from you you I'm, could tell me well, yeah, yeah, let me get yeah, some yeah. perspective uh, no, tell me tell me your initial question which was is it too late to go back or is there some point of no return uh gears does pretty well as a product uh it sells for 60 dollars. i think maybe after people purchase, maybe 30% of players play a game of multiplayer at all. If I had to guess, maybe 50% on the high side. Um, 
of that, probably over 70 to 80 percent of them bounce within a week. Uh, that's pretty normal for any kind of game that's sold as a single player product that player is just tacked onto, you know. Um, so we're already down to what 10 percent of sales is the regular multiplayer player base. Uh, of that group, probably half of them play Horde and Escape exclusively. Um, or primarily, I think that's something that Epic had said way back in the day with Gears 3 or maybe it was Judgment or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I assume that number is still the case because when you look at the uh, battle pass and stuff, it's very, very Horde-centric and Escape-centric. Um, so it stand to reason there's probably a large player base that plays that. They're quietly happy. They don't even, they don't bitch on Twitter. <laughs> they don't <complain laughs> do the they farm. think? They play Gears. <laughs> yeah, they don't, uh, they don't complain about every little minor detail that changes in a patch note. Um, and then from that group, we now have a remaining group that plays multiplayer as their core thing. Let's continue playing past the first week. Uh, I'd imagine that half of them are probably in quick play um, or arcade nowadays. I think they said that arcade is the most popular game mode post-launch. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, those people are less sensitive to stuff like uh, the movement change or shotgun changes or anything that we've discussed on this today including like whether the game's fast, slow, methodical. Um, maybe they care about whether it's respawn modes and not respawn modes. I think that's probably a line which would stand true to that whole community. Um, but the reality is that once you take all those chunks out, the amount of money that is represented by the remaining community and the player base is very small. And the amount of potential players that can be pulled in from all sources, whether that's releasing on PC, um, whether it's pushing more in like a region like Brazil or South Korea, I don't, I have no clue if Gears mm -hmm. has ever played some. Um, the amount of people you can gain by doing all these other things is four or five, six times, ten times the player base that's currently existing. Uh, so I think that when you think about the minute details and what matters, it's surprising at all to me that uh, the coalition even balances the game for multiplayer, or sorry, for competitive multiplayer. Um, think that it's really a sign that they want to be involved and they, mm -hmm. from a passion standpoint, not a product standpoint, from a passion standpoint, want to be there for the competitive scene out of mm -hmm. pure interest, like not any kind of economic thing, which to me is like the most true. It's like, hey, we have minimal resources. We don't yeah. have enough stuff to get all the stuff done we want to do, but we're still going to spend time focusing on this. So when they make a decision like, hey, we think the movement would be better with this direction. And we have this general idea in our mind what it's going to be. And they're stepping towards it. It then is a giant leap of faith to be like, okay, competitive community gives us feedback and to not just feel disheartened yeah. <laughs> you know, when the response goes back. So it's super challenging. But getting back to the original point, yeah, I think you could change the game entirely. Uh, you could go, hell, it'd be like Gears 3 Overrun is now what Gears of War is. And as a product, probably doesn't suffer much. Um, it's strictly a like relationship with the community type. Yeah, and and you know, and and as you said, you know, because it's like you know those small group of people that's that, that's left. You know, if everybody else is is gone within the first few months, you know, uh, for the group that 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 stays and consistently plays, uh, you know, on on uh, you know, it is appreciated on, on the coalition, even you know, balancing it out and, and getting us to that. To that better point, you know, they they do have a lot invested in the multiplayer in the esports, and they do listen, and you know they have to, uh, you know, and they do things their way to, you know, take in all the information, not get overwhelmed, and I feel like you know, you know, I appreciate how better they've gotten about that because before they, you know, they hopped right in, and then the community was, you know, not the best, you know, and then they, they took a step back and they found a good spot to be able to, you know, better gather the information uh, from everybody. And, you know, and I do appreciate uh, all the stuff that they're doing because, guys, think about it. You know, I remember, like, I was thinking about last night that, you know, I, you know, the type of player I am where I don't complain about too many things because, you know, back in the day, like, it was just that what we got was what we got and we had to figure out how to be the best on it. And I've just always been the type of person where I'm just like, all right, today, this is just what I got to do to, uh, to kind of be good in here. But we didn't start getting support towards the back end of Gears 3. Gears 1, Gears 2 was whatever they wanted, okay? We had an entire circuit at MLG. And the only way that we were even able to play the exact settings of LAN was that our host 
had to start Gears of War, unplug his Ethernet cord from his Xbox, and then he had to get past the loading screen, plug it back up, start the, you know, sign in, and now his Xbox had LAN settings to be able to practice on. We did that for an entire season. And then we got dropped in 09. And, uh, you know, later on, Gears 3 came out, Hyperstation, you know, Epic and MLG never worked together again at that point specifically. Uh, but they never, they, you know, it wasn't a, a, a big want or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big care whatsoever. And, uh, you know, there has been improvements made uh, over the last few years. So I am, I am thankful for that because, you know, we would have been the same Gears players where, um, you know, we're up here, you know, wanting changes and stuff, but we know that we probably won't get them and we're just dealing with what we got and making the best of it. Yeah, I think the distinction to me and the reason that uh, to this day, I'm still one of those uh, competitive should be the same as the core game guys. Um, yep, same. And, uh, I'm with you on that one. Everything works best when ideally the company is financially invested in what's happening and has a benefit to doing it. I think that when competitive is making money for the company, um, a like meaningful amount of money or um, or the or the what competitive is aligned so closely with what casual play is or what core play is, um, then it allows everyone to kind of like completely align focuses and push forward. Um, whereas being stuck in a spot where you're kind of relying on people to really be passionate about the product, yeah, and uh, it's hard because like for them, it's not rewarding at all. <laughs> like mm -hmm. being in that spot of being a developer, making changes to the competitive community is brutal. Was, like, um, you, everyone has different thoughts. Like you can't even, you'll never please everyone. I don't know if you could talk and, about it, but was Fortnite in that situation? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, yeah, for a bunch of different reasons. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've experienced it working really in every game that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when you hear developers talk on Twitter or like at GDC or wherever, like generally developers don't look positively on competitive players. Like uh, it's a group that's generally seen as overly privileged uh, complainers. I think a more recent thing has been that social media allows like them to amplify their complaints. But the reality is that developers are usually making a product that's meant to make money for the company. Uh, even if it's a small company or a big company, it doesn't matter. And even when amplified, a competitive player's complaints or an influencer's complaints are a tiny, tiny percentage of the overall people that play. And you can't over index on kind of addressing them. Yeah. So being in a spot where like you're a competitive or your developer trying to help competitive players is ultimately like you working extra hours every week to try and please someone that you'll never be able to please. <laughs> uh, and ultimately like just hoping that you get enough out of that personally to feel like it was uh, beneficial. You, men you know, like mentally, because you enjoy doing it. Yeah. Um, I think, like, that's a lot to ask, um, and it requires very special people to even, like, attempt it, uh, much less to, thick like... Thick-skinned people in this community, too. Thick. With the community that we got, you got to have thick skin if you're on the other side trying to trying to take care, trying to please us. <laughs> that's the uh, Yeah, no, it's impossible. Like, <laughs> here's a, here's, here's a big thing, right? It was completely received um, positively, and it was what they asked for. Then next week, they'll have something else that, <laughs> you know, is the new thing. Like, it's an endless stream. I mean, what the two esports that I think are a lot similar to to us, right? To Gears of War, and I'm I know we don't have anywhere near the clout or, uh, you know, the program that that these two have, but like I think more of like Rainbow Six, and I think more of like uh, CS:GO. Like those are games I think about when I compare Gears of War, like, and it's you know in whatever I think is like the perfect form of it. Like those are the types Round of games base, I think about, right? Single elimination. Oh yeah. So so those. From like from just like a competitive standpoint of like when it was at its prime, you know, different types of strategies, the game that tended to be slower, you know, usually symmetrical maps, some things like that. I'm not saying it's the same game, of course. Yeah, it's I think not. the distinction can't compare, is can't compare a, a PC game. Different. Yeah, yeah, of course. As a physical product, of course, it's extremely different. But I'm just talking about a couple of little things that just remind me of those types of esports, right? So what I'm saying is like, so let's say, let's just picture this. It's just a, I'm really curious what Sky will say here. Um, Sky, let's just say tomorrow you have someone's job at TC and like, I'm not saying you want to work at TC by any means, you can do whatever you want, but I'm just saying, let's say you're with all the developer experience you have, right? You worked on Fortnite, definitely one of the most sense, like successful games in regards of a business model perspective, I would say at the very least, you know what I'm saying? So 
knowing that you've worked with that type of, you know, you know, Epic Games and all the people over there and even working with a lot of the old school Gears guys, like, if you had an idea of what you think, like, Gears of War kind of could be, what would your opinion be? Would, would you make it slower? Would you make it faster? Like, I don't know, just like a little, like a few minutes on, like, what you think you would do, knowing your experience. Uh, I think that, and uh, it's really helpful to, like, watch new players play a game. Uh, just like completely blind, having never played Gears, for example, and kind of like see where mm -hmm. they stumble. Um, but to me, the game has become less approachable over time from a multiplayer standpoint, especially. And why would uh, you say that? Uh, it's become faster. The environments are noisier just by the nature of graphics improving. Um, mm -hmm. And the weapon set is getting more and more complex because the very nature of you building a game every single lot year or whatever. Yeah, is that you build the comments there. So, you know, like it just naturally would get more complex than Hell Gears 1. We have like six weapons. Yeah. Um, so I yeah. know. Like it, it's crazy because you know it's so crazy. It's like I, I know that there's so many people out there. Like when I'm on Twitter, I see so many people that are like, oh yeah, I love Gears 2. It's always Gears 2, Gears 2, Gears 2. And I'm like, damn man, all those people I played Gears 1 with, there were so many, but they just don't use Twitter. And it's like I, I never see Gears 1 mentioned anywhere near as much as 2. Or, or even three, because a lot of the underground kids, they're like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles of Gears of War. They just came out of nowhere from playing underground, and now most of them are even pros, which is crazy. Two but when you look back at it... From one. Yeah, but when you, when you look back at it, it's like one is so different than not only what we have now, but also even mostly what we had in three, and even so, in some areas too. Like two is the closest one to one, but a lot of people just don't mention one, and that's the thing. It, you could go to any tournament and if you were a casual player the only thing that you had to worry about changing was a, a hammer of dawn to a boom shot and a bull talk to a hammer burst everything else was the same yeah you know but it just it just kind of blows my mind so like you would say like you think it would be like slower to an extent would it be better like and you're saying the environments are, are loud and noisy so like maybe that makes it not as easily accessible of course if matchmaking was better that would really help um i always talk to tc and try to tell them like they need to improve like the incentive in the game and stuff like that like a lot mm -hmm. of things that cost iron which costs money there needs to be more things you could earn within the game without spending a dollar you know reward the people that are the grinders the achievement hunters and things like that and when i think about that it always brings me back to Years of War 3, because during that game, you remember you could earn all those characters within the yeah, game. It was like the cool, the, the, the progression. It was incredible. Like, and then we had Gears 2, that is one of the like most you know people's favorite matchmaking. And then when I see people like praising Gears 2 matchmaking, I'm like, damn, like yeah, it was kind of good, but there are so many other games with better matchmaking, like Halo 2, for example, Halo 3, for example. I'm still I felt upset like that did. no other game ever even duplicated Halo 3s or Halo 2s. I think it's tough system. though because didn't like, the people even that on... That's the best ranking system I think I've ever played. No I think ever, that, yeah, the best like, ranking never, I ever played in my life was Halo 2. Like somebody had to hit a patent and they was like, F all y'all, this is mine. Like y'all um, well, no, did it, did, Microsoft did it? made True Skill off of that same format. And True Skill uh, was awful. But it wasn't True Skill is configurable. Uh if you were to look at what match times were back in the Halo 2 and Halo 3 days, they were like uh way, way longer than what's considered acceptable, it's acceptable nowadays. Uh, uh, Skill on its own is okay if you 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 pick how long you want the thing to look for players basically, and what was found over time and what Call of Duty I think capitalized on really heavily was that no, most players just prefer to get no match. Didn't care well, about. I mean, most what, players what? chose to rather not get a matchmaking. Uh, rather than get an easy game, is what you tried to say, just to, to clarify. Yeah, they just want to get into a game, and start shooting stuff. Like that's the that's what most people want. Um, so it ends up being that every single game that releases starts tweaking that more and more and more towards match times and away from match quality, and you end yeah. up with stuff that. It's so crazy terrible. though, bro. Because the thing is, is like when you go back and you look at Halo Two, right, and you and you look at that game and the way the matchmaking was done. I guess the real reason it was just so successful is just because it had such a large player base. And at the well, time, as an FPS, the, it high. didn't have. You don't think they did? You don't think Halo Two had a big player place when we were By playing back in the day? To uh, more modern products, uh, if you look. Oh at no, it, more modern. Yeah, no, it doesn't. If you compare. look at sales data, for example, Gears Three, sure. I think, sold. Five to ten times as much as Gears One. It was a lot. Like, yeah. sold way more better than Gears One. Gears well, Judgment. You know I'm not gonna say compared I'll... to Halo Two. 
uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'd imagine that Halo 3 had more players than Halo 2, and I imagine that Reach had more players. Man. Like, that's just been the just, rule the, 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 the reason I bring The reason I bring it up is because, like, back in the day, I just remember when I was playing Halo 2, if I ever made a new account, I could always get matches really quick. You know, it didn't take me long to get a match until I was in, like, the mid-40s. Like, when I was in, like... I think the four, like 44, and 44, I think the highest 45. rank I ever achieved. I think, I, think the highest, I think the highest rank I ever <laughs> achieved without, like, because I didn't cheat or anything like that. I think the highest I ever re received was, like, 47 and maybe 48 in Big Team Battle. Yeah, when I, was I got 48 squad. was my highest with Shy Guy. It was, like, 47 or 48 in Halo 2, and then <laughs> no, Halo no, 3 no, getting a 50 was, e was way easier. But I just, I just want to say that whole, whole division, whole, uh, fucking, whole division trust the process, because if the ranking system worked, and my fault, if the ranking system matched you up against equal skill, right? Yeah, like, the lower tier players, it may be more of them. But over time, shouldn't it, each tier of the queue kind of get balanced out as more people progress and more people get brought to the game? Like, isn't it something like, make the correct ranking system and have the patience for it to get populated? But nowadays, is what you see is people don't want it at all, Blaze. Yeah. They don't want what at all? They don't want match ranking at all. They just want to be able to hop in the games, I think, for the most part, well, and be able to the, hop out without problems, right? The At people least... that are most vocal on forums tend to be in the top 50% of skill level or whatever. And because they've played games now between uh, Call of Duty, Fortnite, uh, I don't know how many other games, uh, Battle Royale in general kind of lends yeah. itself to this. Um, but they play games that don't have it and now are in a position where it's like, oh, these games that don't have it, I'm really successful in. Uh, I get lots of kills. I stop everyone. I have fun. Um, this is better than me winning 50% of the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And those are people that are vocal on forums that post. So the outcry that's happening across uh, Call of Duty is dealing with it right now, Fortnite dealt with it, um, mm -hmm. is, hey, like, matchmaking's bad. Uh, so, like, that reinforces the true skill thing, which happened over time, which is that, like, hey, match quality doesn't matter to most people, surprisingly. Yeah, uh, is it? Is, is that, I, got a, I got a question for you then. I'm, I'm curious. Oh, were you, done with, your, were you done with your point, Scott? Because your mic kind of. Yeah, like, yeah, okay. it was it. Okay, okay. I, I just had a feeling, my bad. I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, nah, you good. But and by the when, way, um, yeah, we're going we to we start coming down to the close. Yeah, switching close, it. Close, yeah. yeah, either yeah, switch sure. it towards the end, maybe talk about active reload, fragile logic, even touch bases on that. And then we'll wrap it up because we're going to approach like towards the two hour yeah. and a half mark yeah, of this podcast. Yeah, it, it, gets, it, it gets up yeah, there when you get talk posted about up it. Y'all enjoying it, it in the chat and y'all listening to it. Uh, you know, but, you know, when, when the people go back and, and rewatch it, I, I don't want them to, you know, I'm on my Joe Rogan shit today, you know. <laughs> I don't want them to have a two and a half, three hour podcast. Yeah, wrap, wrap, wrap it up, wrap it up type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the last question I would ask to have to do with any of this stuff, because I'm just curious what you guys will say. Is, is there a way to have an option? Like, is that a thing? I've never really seen it in a game before, but are you allowed to have, like, okay, let's just say I, I log into the game, and today I'm going to play matchmaking, and TC's redone all of matchmaking, and it's way better. Is there a way to have an option of, okay, I want to go for, you know, finding quicker matches or preferring quicker matches, or, you know, just getting, like, um, you know, matchmaking with people of similar skill level, and they figure out how to do that? Because I swear, there was a game that did that. W wasn't it one of the Halos? I can't remember which one. But I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong, just going off of memory from a while ago, that one of the Halos you could choose, like, which one you wanted. I almost want to say it was Halo 3. Like, I actually think to it was that. To be able to choose which, what? Yeah, like, like you wanted to choose if you wanted a quicker matchmaking time, or mm -hmm. if you would like to have, like, people of similar skill sets. Uh, a part mm -hmm. of me wants to say that you were able to put a preference in there, and that was done, I believe, in Halo 3. And honestly, when looking back at it, I feel like Halo 3 had so many different things that if Gears of War had those things, it just would be a much more complete game. And obviously, without talking about balancing of weapons and things like that, it'd be, it'd be making people much more likely to play. But yeah, um, Pod mm -hmm. even was saying in the chat, Population it had to filter sure. like faster game, more equal mm -hmm. skill, etc. And that's what I'm talking about. Do you guys think that something like that would be useful in Gears of War 5 and maybe would help make TC's job a little bit easier so it's not necessarily end-all, be-all to one side, but trying to find something to where we could satisfy different demographics of players. Is that a solution that could be useful? 
I mean, if the population isn't there for people that want it's not there yet, right? Yeah, that, that was the other thing. No matter what, there's no solution. And, right? we, and like, we have a so yeah, many. I was, worried, I was also, worried about that. Unlike VR, is like we have like so many different game types, and we have so many different levels of that, right? From quick play to you do hop in a ring playlist, and then you got your core. You got your core yeah. king of the hill execution guardian and now escalation <laughs> yeah yeah right and you still got your core guardian people and escalation execution and king of the hill people and don't forget about the tdm which was one of the worst things that we did because we never came yes. back from adding tdm and gears 3 like no. we oh once God. tdm got added to gears 3 shit you know the matchmaking went in a whole different route people were like tdm i know tdm i play tdm every game let's go fucking play some tdm and they never left Okay, we never see those people ever again. They've been there since the shit came out, and we still have it out for it. I just feel like ever since we... Like, if we go back to the whole Gears War 1, for example, I just felt like that game was so perfect for multiple reasons. One being because we literally only had three game modes, and then you could say, yes, we did have a fourth one that came out with a DLC, which was Annex. So it was... Warzone, Execution, Guardian, Annex. Yeah. So you basically, let's, I mean, look at Gears 5 now. How Annex first respawn game type? type, by the way. Yes, it was. That's a good note to take for sure for any people out there that haven't played Gears 1 or UE. But think about now. I mean, think about 4, think about 5. I mean, especially 3. How many different game modes did we have? Because first off, you have to count how many there was. I think there was on average 7 to 8 game modes, if not a little bit more than that. Yeah. And then you have to multiply the special, like, modes. Like, you had your Horde in three. You had your Beast in three. So, let's, then... let's, 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 count, let's count them. So, in one, we had Execution, Warzone, and I think we started off with Guardian. Those were the three. And they were the only Actually, three. Uh, assassination? Assassination? Assassination was not Guardian. Was it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Assassination yeah. was Guardian. Yeah, yeah, same thing. Okay. Same yeah, thing. I, 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 I forget sometimes. I just remembered the name. My bad. And but then, uh, then what? Annex added in over time, right? Yeah, Annex added in later. But then here's another point I want to make before we keep adding this okay. stuff up. Just, okay, four game modes in the first one. Now think about the map selection in the first one. Because I know some people earlier in the stream were saying, man, we need more maps. And don't get me wrong, I would love more maps. But for competitive, I mean, look at Counter-Strike, for example. Look at their map rotation over the years. It's been almost the same, right? Mm -hmm. The same core maps. Mm -hmm. So now look at Gears War 1. I mean, there wasn't that many maps, but you loved playing those maps because you yeah. knew them. You could always do different ways of playing them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't about the maps. It was about the damn gameplay. So that's another thing to consider why we move on this like little exercise. So Man, let's move to no, Gears we didn't, War. No, we didn't play any dark maps, by the way. I want to just kind of throw that out there. I think like we didn't play a map like Asylum where it was uh, just a, a dark, gloomy map from all of them. Mansion? Uh, no, nope, Mansion was daylight. Mansion Gears 1. Gears 1? Was it, it wasn't dark, was it? Uh, oh, yeah. Middle me. of the night, raining. Gears, dark. Was it, Gears it, it, 2 Gears, Mansion was light. Gears, 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 was Gears, Gears was Yeah, you're right. You're right. Gears UE Mansion it was, was light, too, I want to say. Wasn't it? Gears UE Mansion, what? I think they lit it up. Yeah, they lit it up yeah, a, a bit more. Yeah, no, it was daylight. Okay. It was daylight, okay. and uh, it was daylight in UE, 100%. Yeah. Okay. And then, was I mean, lighter you kind of, you had uh, Old Bones that was dark. When it came out as a DLC. And I just said that for the viewers, because when we talk about fun maps, when it comes to gameplay and them just being able to see, understand what's happening, what makes this map um, special. Bright maps are so much better, yeah. And, 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 and a lot, and I actually, like, this is another issue when it comes down to that, is just where are we putting the weapons on the map are super important. I think that some maps we can take a double look at what why you put the power weapons there, because... You know, marksman weapons need, like, snipers need to go on the high ground always to even to give them that advantage, and explosives need to go down low. Drop shot changed the game on the, on the balance in that just a little bit. Also, on the flip end, our spawn system has been forever fucked, and I don't understand why we just can't make it balanced. So, but continue. Sorry. I, okay, I'm very so passionate about the spawn system. That's why I say fuck like that, because it's a lot behind <laughs> that. <laughs> but continue. So so let's take a look then at Gears 2. So we had Warzone that came back. We had Submission, which was basically capture the flag with a NPC character that was acting like a flag, so to say, for those of you that never played it. We had Wingman, which a lot of people still want back nowadays. We had Execution, Guardian, and Next came back again in that one. Uh, King of the Hill made its debut in that one. Gears and then there was Horde. This is Gears 2 alone. Two. Okay, okay, okay. 
So between those seven different types of multiplayer modes and then Horde, there was a total of eight in Gears of War 2. And then if you jump to Gears of War 3, that's where like things really hit, like shit hit the fan. Because first off, you have to count all the game modes. But then second, you have to count the special events. And then third, you have to count that there was casual and competitive. So that really split the population mm. so much across all the game modes. Yeah, more. And then on top of that, you had Horde again, but you also had Beast in that one. So, like, by the time you were done, yeah, by the time you were done, you had, like, 18 to 20 different game modes. Like, how do you expect to keep a population or be able to get good enough data when you literally split your whole population every which way the wind blows? Man, I'm all, you know, honestly, you make make such a valid point there. And, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, hearing it all again, too, as well. Because uh, we've always known that we've had a lot of different game types, but to understand at the levels in which they were added and more options were given and more options were given here and there, and it's, you know, you're it's just like a splitting. Netflix syndrome, right? You <laughs> yeah. have Netflix when it first came out, you had some limited. Oh, well, I like this, I like this, and it's now natural. Have... We got so, and it's natural, we're gonna have so many opinions, oh. but. We don't got the players for that type of variety. Let's 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 keep it real. Like population yeah, for, the, exactly. for that variety. Like you know, I will much. Hell, I will man. <sighs> and then you think about like Joe keeps talking about Ultimate Edition, which I do agree is probably my favorite Gears of War, if not Gears of War One. But look at that step we took back when TC remastered that. Mm-hmm. We were back to literally no game modes, and it was a successful game. Mm. because people were playing the game modes there was popular streamers and old guns that were shooting in that mm-hmm. game and the shit was populated and popping we were because every fucking you night. did not yeah you had four game modes you weren't everywhere you only had you know four what's so crazy you, you know what's so crazy about that ue had like no updates it had like nothing to make the game they, better they they i think it has it, i think it, it had on four I think it had one update, and the other thing that's crazy is it didn't even have many playtests. Now, usually we can't talk about playtests that much because of eight NDAs and stuff like that, but one of them was public, which was one of the ones I was at in years four with like a, bu- a bunch of like other pro players, and mm-hmm. at the time I was a pro player, right? And when, yeah. when I went there, it was just like it, – it's, it's one of those things where it's like if we had those types of playtests – Right. And then they're taking like not only just listening to our feedback yeah. and saying, OK, we appreciate what you guys have to say, but they're actually implementing it because that's a big problem. Right. It's like we go to play tests, we say things and then things don't end up happening in the game. And of course, there's reasons for that. Different demographics of players, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. Right. But the point is. I always say all the time, imagine if UE actually had real updates. Imagine if they were able to make the game mm. much smoother for the newer At types of players time, that like right? to move fast in time. Imagine if wall bounce canceling was even a thing because we know that people hate the fact that they can't do it. Like that's that's, that's like, why people me, say myself, Gears 2 is their favorite. More than if one. I made my own Gears game and I didn't have to think about like, you know, being uh like compromising for anyone of course i would take wall bounce canceling out but i i'm always trying to keep in mind like okay we can't do that because too many people would be outraged right or be pissed off so that's not an option right taking out even what's up average player can't even do it what can't do it what average player doesn't wall bounce the average player doesn't wall bounce yeah yeah no i i know that but I'm just saying, there's a very we have a very big Latin American a fan base. Group of players that you're talking about, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely am. It, it, it's definitely a spe- and I appreciate you know correcting me on that. <laughs> but it's a specific group of players for sure that love wall bouncing. But also that those people who love it so much, they're also very loud on social media. You know, they're more up to date. They use Twitter. Like a lot of the people that I know that wouldn't want wall bouncing in the game in regards to like wall bounce canceling. Those guys, you know, most of them aren't around anymore, at least that I know of. But like you said, there's probably a hidden group of people that aren't that vocal on social media, like forums and Twitter and stuff like that, that probably would love that. But I'm just saying, if UE was done better to be smoother and the map does like you remember, we had broken maps. We had Mansion was all messed up. It was totally different and it was not in a good way. A lot of angles were taken out and things that made the map special. Clock Tower didn't work. You know what I'm saying? You got stuck every time you ran up and down the line. There was plenty of issues. Even when we went to Ohio, I remember my team, we lost to E6 because literally the smoke grenades didn't work. You threw a smoke and it would literally be not even visible on the other team person's team so they could shoot us through it and mark us through it and on our team the smoke Classic. is there but think all those types of things imagine if they were fixed imagine if tc focused on that game as the foundation i just feel like that was kind of Instead more of the right way 
Instead, they instead they made Gears, Gears of War four, Gears 3 like like, and, and they choose Gears three as the foundation. It's like, damn it! It's like, now once again, you've given the all these players the food again. You gave them the food that they really like, and now that was an like, opportunity to go back because Gears three that was their opportunity. Out. And then and then, but once again, I also feel like it's one of those things where it's like we're giving them feedback and trying to give what we believe is our expert opinion. Of course, we have to understand as developers, they're much understand more understand the players than us. that they were asking too. Like those, what they it's, do. yeah, it's just it's it's tough, man. Because it's like, damn, I I just felt like that was also one of the big wrong turns. And like Jip says, I feel like so many more people played. Like I said, High Distortion now basically famous in Fortnite. Nick Merckx now pretty much famous in Fortnite. Doctor Disrespect coming back to play the game a little bit, Loved you know, it. It, it, but he liked it. But he also is really confused by it. But, I yeah. don't think he's as confused on center screen. Once again, it just goes back to that. I feel like someone of his caliber that's you know skilled mm, in multiple different yeah. FPS titles with a big fan base, he might enjoy the old school more. You know Nate Shot enjoys the old school. Yeah. And you know he sure as hell doesn't enjoy the new school because we heard what he had to no, say. But, but, you, know, you, have, you, have, you have Nick Merckx and all these other guys super talented like at multiple games. I just feel like a lot of that big fan base, you go that UE him? type of route, they might be into it. Yeah. Well, to play devil's advocate really quick. Sure, I mean, sure. That's the whole point. I, I definitely love the idea of they would have breached off a of UE. And no doubt, I really wish that was the goddamn move. Unfortunately, we're here. We it's know not. that now. But <laughs> yeah. one of the reasons why I think Gears of War 1 was so successful in kind of a strange way, to say the least, is because you got to remember, back when that game came out, the idea of adding on new things to games was rare it was a new thing that was happening so yeah. gears of war one you really only had i believe two dlcs you had one that added annex and it added four new maps which you would have to help me remember i want to say it was garden subway process and there's another one uh, that was a second but you but oh, you close man. on it you you right you and right. then the other update this was, was all course, this garden bone yeah and then there was Old Bones and Raven Down that came with Annex or anyway, like two downloads and that was it. There was really no changes to the game's mechanics. There was no changes to that. And now here we are in 2020 with amazing technology, but like the idea that any of us can hop on social media or hop somewhere, complain about something, and we know that the developers have the opportunity to tweak things and change things. Do you think that, to a degree, that has caused a lot more issues than, say, the old days where they couldn't really do that as often? I feel like they're almost more pressured sometimes to make a change, whether it's good or bad now, and sometimes that kind of crosses a bad line. And, Sky, you might have some good insight on that. Yeah, shit's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. That, That's what it is. <laughs> Back in the day, we complained the whole time too on the forum, so it wasn't like it was a new phenomenon that people are clamoring for changes or fixes or whatever. But they, 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 they was just like you know, fucked them a little bit more back then, you know. And they just kept, they did their own thing, and we. Oh, just I think they replied to us explicitly on the forums at one point and said, "Fuck you guys." Yeah, and, and then uh, they just did their own thing, and we just had to deal with it, right? And we just dealt with it the best way that we could, and we would just change the weapon swaps on maps. And you know, we'll do our little Gears Core community thing and we'll just go have a good time with it. And, you know, yeah. But it does, I agree that it does make it difficult. I think, I think, it, I think it makes it a little bit difficult. Well, it, it should technically make it easier because, okay, cool. I have this technology to get more opinions from so many different areas and see what they want, right? But then now you have to choose how you value these opinions. And that's yeah, where it becomes, trap, that's where it becomes tricky, trap. right? Is okay. Yeah, the prioritizing. And, that was and, the and main it's thing not more so. And you gotta ask yourself: Is it the majority that we should be really listening to? Because they're the majority, right? If the majority wants this, then that must be what's right. Or is it the minority who hasn't got off the game and just understand it at probably at one of the same levels as a developer? Because I always say that as a developer. You have to have a lot of respect for the people who have broken your game and who have probably played it on the sticks more than you have. You may have been behind it on the numbers a little bit more, behind the scenes, and understand why things are what they are. But somebody who understands, you know, because players can understand the game better than the person who probably made it, right? Or probably have, yeah. a, have, a, have a different uh, vision. Within a narrow, within a narrow scope, because... 
for example, I don't think you guys have considered the change or the impact of the movement changes on the horde player base. For example. Like, I'm sure, the horde players sort of probably love it. And a player, like, they have to take into account all that other stuff as well as like, Slow hey, will this affect now. new players coming in or whatever? Boom. Like, usually a competitive player doesn't care to think about those problems. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, you're saying you're saying like people that play escape, people that play horde, and naturally, of course, in horde and escape, I would assume that the that the people that love to play those types of games want it to be fast. I mean, escape is literally a game type when you're running out of a place that's got toxic gas everywhere and you're trying to get out. So yeah, of course you're going to be able to have yeah, faster times done. and things like that if you're faster. That's of course true, but the thing is, is we have this crazy challenge, right? We're trying to TC wants it so that we don't have to have more than one tuning, right? The competitive community preached to TC for ages that we want to make it the same tuning, and we were basically a little bit similar to, and, we're, and we are willing to sacrifice for that, right? But then what it seems like from just reading the forums and stuff like that a decent amount lately, like I read them like maybe a half an hour or like an hour in the morning. I just go through, I see what people are saying, like when I'm having breakfast or whatever, and then save my VOD time for like afternoons and stuff like that for work for the team, um, you know, for our reciprocity roster. And when I'm reading it, it just seems like, it's kind of bend don't break with a lot of these guys. Like, it doesn't seem like they really want to, like, at least from what I'm reading most of the time, it doesn't seem like they want to be flexible or compromise. It's just like they have their experience. They want it the way that they want it. And that's kind of it. So I'm hoping that we could find like that common ground. And I don't know, just for me, it's just the older update. I felt like we, I didn't think we needed to fix it. Clearly TC thinks we do. I feel like TC is going to give us blogs and all these reasons for, why they did what they did, but I hope that I know this is long for them to listen to, and they're very busy nowadays. But I hope they take the time to listen to this and see what we all had to say. Because the thing is, is it's going to really help the integrity of, like I said, the initials, the setups, and all mm -hmm. that type of stuff. If they do go back and just dial it down just a tad, if it was my call, I there's so many things I wouldn't have the game that I know would outrage people. So I'm not even going with what I would want. I'm going with what I think is the best thing to work out for, for everybody and keeping other people in mind. You know what I'm saying? I know Horde players want the game faster. You know, I know that Escape players mostly want the game faster and that casual players, there's the ones that are very vocal that want it faster. And like Sky said, I would not be surprised at all that there's people that would love it to be slower, right? So I just feel like you dial down that movement a little bit on the topics we talked about. You know, I, I'm not even saying completely take out the update speed boost, which I do think would be amazing. I do think it would really help out gameplay if there was no update speed boost tremendously. But like I said, we got to keep everybody in mind, so it's going to be hard to do. But hopefully they listen to this and they hear everything we have to say about it, you know, and they give us that 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 middle ground, hopefully, because we've been trying to, you know, be flexible a lot more than people realize for a long time. We made a document, talked about all the different times the competitive community tried to, you know, keep the casual community in mind it's it's quite a few you know just a really quick blaze and joe and sky i like to thank you guys for letting me on thank you. i normally wouldn't do this but my team needs me to scream it's right okay, now it's okay yeah, no, I know. Right I've, I've, already, I've, I've, already, I've already missed one block and i'm missing part of the second block I yeah, know. Joe, joe got his people as well too you know both of y'all yeah i just i just told them i was like guys we're off tomorrow i'm just gonna watch most of the vods tomorrow and i'll have all the data up by halfway through the day and then just go through their footage so time stamp it or whatever if there's any other questions or anything, like feel free to send them my way, Blaze. I'll come back on there. Okay. No, I appreciate I love you talking. Too. You know, but I, I gotta hop off, guys. Chat, stream, give this man a follow and a subscription. Follow all these wonderful guys, and we love you. At least I'm out. These guys are staying, I think. Yeah. But it was it was awesome having time. you here. It was awesome having you here, Jip. Much Thank love. you so much. All right. Uh, Jip out. So, uh, we did have, so, uh, we did have, and I agree with you, Joe, you know, I do hope that, you know, uh, and this is one of the main reasons for the show is that to just be able to have the, the conversation and the open conversation and, uh, you know, you know, say how you feel about it and, you know, uh, and for us to just, you know, put it all out there and, you know, and just hope and hope for the best, you know, uh, but yeah. I want to, you know, have a spot for the conversation. So I do, uh, let's see, I had I actually had two questions come in from the Twitter and I'm just going to use those questions and after these we can kind of kind of wrap it up uh, mm -hmm. so Crazy Train said question for the show as much as the mechanics have changed from the epic titles to the TC titles how important is it to focus on the change that happened from single life game modes to objective game modes when considered the competitive state of the game and we kind of even touched bases on that a little bit but 
you know, one of y'all can uh, can 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 take that. Uh, it's uh, it's up to Sky. Either Sky could take it or I could take it. I know what I would say. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it changes everything. Yeah, no, nah, yeah, nah, it, 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 does. The the game. it does. It does, and it's night and day, right? Because we we talked about it throughout the the entirety of the show. Just you know, it's different how you approach, uh, you know, strategy and and how people watch the strategy of the game and watch the players play and unfold when it's single life versus respawn. And now, when you are playing respawn game modes, even if you do have a life counter, it's still a lot that happens. More than it is the slower pace at times, and you know for the most part, and it's still you know a lot that can that can go down. Granted, the life bank has helped from years four escalation, but in the end, it's still not um, you know at a, at a at a pace where the entire audience is just like is able to understand exactly what's happening, and we're seeing more tactical plays, and we and we have smarter gears players playing the game as well. And I think that's something that is so important. Making that, how do you make the base, how do you make the, the uh, just the, the low level multiplayer guy be able to get to that pro level? How do you make him smarter by just playing the game over time? You know? And then over time he gets better. And he's like, you know what? I feel like I'm ready enough to, uh, you know, go play at a, at a, at a pro level. But these guys just want to wall bounce everywhere. And they don't understand the, the, the tactics. Yeah. I think I think there's a couple things, right? Like back in the day when you wanted to like learn on execution and stuff like that to get better. I mean, you didn't have many videos to go to, right? You pretty much had the VBI ones, and that was yeah, pretty my much videos. It. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. God, I'm saying like your videos, Arctic's. I mean, I I remember watching Arctic all the way back when you had a webcam from the Xbox 360 webcam to do his, yep. you know, videos and stuff like that. Like that's when it kind of really started. And when I look at like comparing Escalation compared to the, you know, the game I fell in love with the most, which was Gears of War 1 and Gears of War UE, those are by far my two favorites, even though I do like 3 a lot. Um, the big difference to, for me is really initial strategy and also the roles of the players. You can't, like I said before, mm -hmm. you can't really notice the roles of the player as much nowadays. If it, like, like I said, when I broke down my team's roster into how all the different roles that they have earlier, um, I think it was a lot more in depth than if I ask another coach on the circuit how he would break down his roster. Like if I had a conversation, maybe with Ashes, it would be similar to my perspective. But if I had a conversation with some of the other guys of some of like the lower ranked teams, like I think that they would, you know, think about it a little differently. But there's a lot more depth that goes into the game, even on the escalation side, than people realize. But when it comes down to initial strategy, right? And when it which comes is all is about the, that was gears at a nutshell. That it, was that was yeah. professional gears is your start. And that's what made it special. It was. It, I remember someone said it back in the day. I wish I remember who. Maybe it was a mortal spawn. But I think they broke it down. They related Gears of War one to like football, like the beginning initial strategies of football, like coming probably, out of coming yeah, out I of you know. And I, I went yeah. So like that's kind of how I thought about it. And like I said, I was a late bloomer. So early in my day, I wasn't on professional teams for a while. It took me a bit to be able to move my way up and also learn from my own mistakes and be more critical of myself over anyone else until I started to develop. And that happened when I was playing in Europe. But when I was running like the Infused team. When I was the IGL of you know TK and stuff like that, I had full in-depth strat books, multiple pages for every single map, tons of different initials, tons of you know audibles outside of the initial. If this audible goes bad, we could resort to this. We could have this type of fallback setup to try to stay alive and get a pinch here if we're in a three v four. All kinds of different things like just knowing damage control situations, having your you know your quick pick strategies, your trap strategies, How many your do you extending in use? one lane to set up L shapes, you know, X angles, all that kind of stuff. And in, in the initial strategy and in escalation, you did not see any of these things any more, any more near uh, enough as, as much as you did back mm -hmm. in the day is the best way I want to say it. And then the other big thing is also player roles. And if the game is a little bit slower, it makes it so much easier to explain to the audience what makes certain pro players so special? Why, why are they like, who they are? Yep. It, like a lot of people don't even realize like the huge differences between, for example, franchise and like Gilbert. And they're two very different types of mm -hmm. IGLs, but both extremely effective in the way that they like to IGL. You know what I'm saying? One of them is much more uh, efficient in chaotic situations, and the other one is much more efficient in structured situations. But neither one is technically the right answer because both instances will happen multiple times in a match. Yeah. So the, the, the thing is, is we need to be able to show the audience all these different, 
different things. Like, for example, I'll, I'll, I, I saw another coach that's been moving up the ranks in the chat, Vora in the chat. For example, like breaking down the NRG and the Mazer match before we played Mazer. You know what I'm saying? The, the big thing is when you're looking at both the, that match specifically, if the game was a little bit slower, not a lot, just a little bit, it would be much more easier for the commentators who are not working with these players every single day to be able to break down why so many moments are so special. You could track the rotations of what Mazer was doing in that matchup to win and be able to note that. And you might be able to notice a couple little things on the initial strategy that they're doing well, but not, no one's talking about the player roles of what makes them so special. They're not talking about, you know, what do you think that Vora is doing in this situation, you know, going up against an RG? What do you think their IGL is doing? What do you think, like breaking down each player, understanding what they truly bring to the table things like that are things i'd like to see on the desk more and a, a person who i think was doing that really good actually and i i pray they actually invite him back more was prospect i thought prospect was killing it on oh, the I desk love, at the last Shane. event even even i remember him and i in the crowd were just sitting there for a second talking about the game talking about initial strategy he and one of the maps we don't play that much he was just talking to me about initial strategy and we ended up talking for like 20 minutes because my team was done for the day and the whole time we're talking about it i was like yeah man i just wish that the concepts that we're talking about had like the consistent win ratios that they should have but they don't because of the way the game is currently right now even if we ran some of these strategies we were talking about it's maybe only a 55 45 chance that you're going to come out with success or at best on a good day when everybody's hitting shots a 60 40 but back in the day when you used to play and you ran a very good strat and you understood an idea or a concept of what the opponent was going to run that strat would usually have a 70 30 success rate some of your really good strats that you wouldn't show that often would have an 80 20 or on really good cases against professional teams maybe a 90 10 you know but we just don't see that anymore there's no way that you're really running a strat nowadays and you're like oh yeah this is an 80 20 matchup win against nrg or other top teams consistently it's just not really a thing right now and part of it is one the game is too fast and and two is the other part of it is the um because the game is so fast like i said initial damage and situations like that aren't as reliable an enforcer a lancer certain weapons that should be like really good like enforcer is supposed to counter you when you're close range most people are going to head down an enforcer right now and shit on him like if you if you have a lancer most people right now are if you're mm -hmm. in single lane coverage and you're by yourself and you've got a guy pushing you if that guy only has 15 to 20 feet of distance to cover he's going to push and get in your face and possibly chunk you before you could even down him that wasn't a thing yeah, in Gears yeah, 3, yeah. that wasn't a thing in Gears 2, and that wasn't a thing in Gears 1. And tracing a Lancer, which was a huge skill in Gears 1, doesn't even matter anymore because now the sensitivities are so fast, you, you don't even need to trace anymore. You never need to let go of the L-Trigger, <laughs> you know, press it again and let go of it and press it again to time your shots perfectly to be a great Lancer player. Just have 30 sensitivity and just lock onto him, hold the L-Trigger, and that's it. And Hopefully, like, TC understands, like, how much this movement is affecting so many different things we talked about today on the show. But, yeah, nah, I yeah, think... We, 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 broke oh, it down, oh, we broke that down We broke lot. it down pretty much as yeah. far as possible. Yeah, no, it was, it was, yeah, it was some, definitely some good conversation on that one. Okay. Um, let's see. The um, other question I had, and I'm about, we're about to wrap this one up. This one was... Uh, we told... Yeah, th see, this guy... So, I'm going to ask this question because we talked about it on the show already it was just that what is the best ranking system to use for ranked matchmaking opposed to the true skill matchmaking that is used now question mark maybe some suggestions that maybe tc can look at to possibly change it to preferably think they should just mimic the halo 2 or something and uh you know we we already went to this discussion about you know the player base the you know uh suggestions of what halo 3 had of faster game equal skill game uh and etc and because you know nobody really used that that matchmaking system really again like after after Halo, um, but yeah you know we, we got our struggles on that one. Also the big point about that was what Sky said. Sky brought up the fact from the developer point of view that it's a thing that TC most likely doesn't even want to go the route of true skill because they realize one possibly some people are saying the player base isn't big enough which is which is more than likely possible sky even said in the chat that a lot of people may be playing the game but a lot of people that are playing the game are not necessarily playing matchmaking so we have a lot of horde players we have a lot of escape players we have definitely a large amount of campaign players that's one thing i've always enjoyed, enjoyed about gears no matter what gears it was i've always enjoyed the campaign um, even the newest one, when it was working, I still enjoyed it. I thought it was really cool. Some mm -hmm. really cool twists on the Locust in there and stuff like that, or the Swarm, if may have you. Um, but the whole point is, 
when you talk about the old school matchmaking, I don't even think it needs to be fully true skill. If they don't want to go the true skill route, okay, so be it. Let's just simplify yeah. it, though, boys. Let's just make yeah. it so that – and girls, obviously. Mm -hmm. But let's just make it so that you literally – if you win a certain amount of games, you go up a rank. If you lose a certain amount of games, you go down a rank. That's what made Halo 2 really good. Whether you were by yourself or whether you winning were with or losing. people, winning or losing, just let's simply make it that and nothing more. And for let the now. player of course, do everything that they got to to make sure that they win over more. Oh, of course, over time, you could work on something else completely. You could try to, you know, bring in pro players, bring in some other people from other communities, maybe bring in some content creators, maybe bring in some, you know, representatives of the casual community that are really good at Horde or really good at Escape to talk about why they don't get into matchmaking but let's just simplify it literally just make it if you win a certain amount of matches you go up a rank if you lose a certain amount of matches you go down a rank and start there all of this trying to analyze the individual it doesn't even make sense yeah. because think about it how are we going to analyze an individual when we're going off of eliminations we don't even have it, kills and assists yeah how the hell are we supposed to know who's doing how much damage we don't have a damage calculator in this game this isn't i think it was bloodborne it was called that had like a damage calculator or something yeah, that I mean, which, which, is, which, which is the most important stat that we still haven't gotten to this day so the we don't <laughs> have, so <first laughs> which all, i've been stressing all, about damage we don't done. even have the most important who's shooting the most who's in, hitting? in in the back button and then we expect the matchmaking system to put everybody in the right place and then we're also talking about possibly not even having enough people on the player base so it just simplifies so boys me, literally so pc yeah, let me, let me kills and assists and wins and losses and let's just start there and then yeah. go from there yeah, and what I one I thing is that gets I, better. yeah, and I said this, uh, I said this back. I said when it came down to gears, and you looked at the scoreboard, right? It was one I felt like back in the day that the scoreboard truly told the story of how well you did in that match, especially with us out here calculating the damage points because it was just twenty five points for a kill, it was ten points for a down, and if you had anything, and so we went down a board, we was like, okay, calculated, calculated. That's 125. This guy has 157 points. He did 27 points of damage in four rounds. Oh my God. Why is he so disgusting? No wonder. And then yeah. if we'll see a guy with one kill and one down, his next teammate has five, and this dude's at the top of the leaderboard. And you knew you'd be like, oh my God, that what is what is such a disgusting support player. The amount of damage he put out to help his teammates get those kills was phenomenal. And so and all you That's really, yeah, right, yeah, and, and all you, had, <laughs> and, and I took a lot of pride in that too, just pulling out my lancer, helping out my slayers on my team like Kenny, and I'm just chilling at the top with one kill. I'm like, yeah, I did my job already, you know. You already know what's up. So, uh, but those numbers were already telling the story of how good you were, and I'm happy that they changed the the, the heal 100 points because when we got to adding in the heels and all these other points was there, the scoreboard got jacked up on who was really making an impact for the for the team during that given map. Uh, because it was just too it was just it was too much. And we the gears players who were performing was not being valued right. We were not valuing the right numbers. You know and and I and I, and yeah, I, and I say and I say we not as like, you know, me and TC, but you know, we as a community, you know, it's just we as gears not value it right you know yeah i mean well when you look at it and you just keep it simple because i know we're limited on time but at this yeah. point i don't really really care how long we take but i'm with it so <laughs> keep it short and sweet though I'm here, so I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I work all the time with the team anyway. We're off tomorrow. I got my whole day. My girl knows how it is. I okay. got trained from Mexico, so it is what it is. But getting to the point, though, when you're looking at the game, right, and you're looking at how we analyze data, I'm going to be so honest with you guys right now. I do a lot of work out of Excel every single day. Constant, I work out of Word a lot when I'm in scrims, mm -hmm. and I work out of Excel even more when practice is done, right? And all the data I use, to, I can't talk about what I do, but I will tell you this. I can't even use most of the data that, you know, all these guys like um, uh, Prodigy, he's incredible, right? Him yeah. and a lot of other people like Jacob, for example, PR, yeah. he provides a lot of really good data. And these guys provide good data, but here's the problem. It's not even that usable at the moment because we don't have the right data on the scoreboard. So th their data is limited. Like, how am I supposed to explain what player efficiency means to a player without using timestamps and footage? They don't really know. They just know that 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 this, this analyst 
believes that they were this percentage effective on the map. Okay, that's great. Then yeah. we have we don't even have assists, so I can't even tell you how many times that a support player actually helped out someone. Did you help someone and help them get a kill, or did you just provide support damage to keep yourself alive? That dude did be, you keep be yourself stuck alive on the side and of the actually map you won't know. Yeah, if you kept yourself alive and you reset, did that actually help out a teammate, help us win another team fight, or did that not matter at all and you just stayed alive and maybe you got a kill or two afterwards? C can we explain to the audience what impactful kills matter and what non-impactful kills matter you know what i'm saying there's so many different areas of this topic where we as a community could be so much more efficient and i would love to broadcast like things like you know what jacob is doing and what prodigy is doing and these guys that are good analysts for our community but i can't even use their information because our developer is not focusing on the right things and what i would love to see the commentators like i said do more is if they get this correct data from the coalition if the coalition could just simply put make it kills make it assists make it debts and maybe there's something else we could talk about in there maybe like a damage calculator for how much damage they're inputting you know what i'm saying but we don't have any of these things so now we limit we limit our casters who we have great commentators out there we have oh, a lot of people who know what they're it, talking we about but guys. we're not even giving them we're not even giving them the best equipment to put the best show possible on and yeah we're lucky we got you know and ryan's in the chat so i'll give him a little gas right now but we're lucky we have umg and these other and these other companies that are willing to help us out and put on a good show for us but we need our developer to step up too and work on these things because then not only can the commentators you know bring the whole you know bring the whole uh, production to a new level but even people like myself people like ashes affinity vora mm -hmm. all these other good coaches you know that are all you know working with professional yeah, I need teams. those numbers now, as well though we we could use those numbers, but we can't use them in the state they are right now. To me, no offense to the people who do this work, because I know that they do mm -hmm. a very good job. I want to just make that clear. But I can't even use your data. Most of my data that I use is homegrown from watching my own footage of my team mm -hmm. or other opponents' teams or my own Excel documents or my own Word documents. So it is what it is, man. Like, But we just got to make this stuff better. Yeah, yeah, you know, as uh, as uh, you know, we know you're getting paid by Big Data America to get all those statistics and stuff. You know, <laughs> hey man, uh, but, I got my like three different jobs you know, I do for record. Know, that's it. <laughs> but hey, but you know, but you are, you know, you're absolutely right. I want to say that you know, towards the last, as of San Diego, we did finally get the ability to pull stats from the game at LAN. Finally, yeah. it was something that was put in towards the future for us to have those uh -huh. numbers. It just cool. comes down to uh, us working with our relationships with PGL to make sure that we can pull them at the rate and, and give that information to the fans and, and what information can we pull. You know, one of my goals is I'm, I'm, I'm going to see if I can still get all the data from the event because I, I, I think that we have it of all the stats from that event. I just don't know. Uh, you know, does, does PGL have it? Did they, did they save it? They got it. I don't know, but I know that we were able to pull some that event and I'm just hoping that that gets better about Mexico because, you know, damage, man. Like even if people heal, like Bro, just years is just kills, all, assist, year, death, years damage. Is all, that's it. That's it. Like, holy shit. The amount of life changing of who, like who is shooting the most and who is hitting shots. Right. I don't care if a player gets, takes 50 damage and his health gets regen. I'm okay with that guy being credited for putting 50 damage out on that player. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it still is the best way to show productivity around all all five players, even if you are now, support what's crazy. or even if you are slayer. Here's what's crazy, right? If let's say, if let's say we get away from this participation trophy strat, which is uh, stat, which is eliminations, like Ryan Fools just mentioned in the chat, right? Hey, it's good Here's for what's the crazy. achievements. Now. <laughs> Just through the back button, right? Like, and also the other thing that you've always spoken about is the fact that the damage stat and the true score stat aren't like really the same, right? Because the true score stat gets influenced by how many caps you're getting on the map. So that stat is completely different and, and, and than a kills. damage and than a damage kills, output. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, than a damage output stat. So if we had assists and kills and a damage output stat along with deaths, now you will see how much damage people are getting when they're in setup situations. And now the commentators don't have to just talk about all the high octane plays that people are making yeah. when they're clutching awesome. up when things go bad. Now we could finally re reward the players yeah. who are doing an incredible job at getting initial damage in setups and talk about the whole strategy behind setups to the audience and make it completely clear, you know, how are these top teams 
really thinking when we're going over these yeah. matches. And now it brings a whole new, like, level of just analytics to the production, and it makes it that much more exciting to watch, now... and it makes it also easier to break down not only the different types of teams that we have that are mm -hmm. very talented on this circuit, but also all the different roles of players, because it will show in the stats. And that's something that we have to be able to fix. Yeah, and, but and... once again... This is another place. But, but on, on the damage, real quick. Gears One, I think, was just the only game. Well, Gears One was the only game, kill secured or not, you got points for the damage you put out. You got you got you got a point of damage you, for for every twenty percent the player was hurt. Yeah. You got four points of damage, which was eighty yeah. percent damage. Um, and then if you got the fifth point of damage, it would never, ever show. So if anyone ever said they had someone five point, they lied to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, but, but that's, it, that's that it was 100% for five points. But that stayed on the scoreboard, I want to say. Those, it did stay on the scoreboard, points, but here, it's just tough to break down. It's not tough. But I mean, you no could break it down. It's well, easy. No, no, no. no it's, I, I was just going to I was just gonna say, it doesn't show as much, though, because it's only one point. Right, a revive was like ten points if I'm and not mistaken, and then a kill, and then a kill was twenty five points, right? Or so twenty five points it for was, a kill, yep. ten for a revive, and one point for a point of damage, right? So the thing is, though, the damage stat in this game though would be so incredible because there's so many situations to set up, there's agreed, so many different agreed, types agreed, of setups yeah. in this game to win matches, and defense is what wins championships. But we get all caught up in the three pieces, the four pieces that these really talented players get. We got to be able to broadcast to the community. Agreed. Everything that it takes to win yeah, yeah, with you know, the esport. A hundred, a hundred percent, Joe. And and that's and that's all I was I was just trying to say on that one was that gears gears one. After that, any damage that you put out and the kill was not secure, it was not on the scoreboard, right? Hence, why yep. I was saying that you can have one kill and one death. My fault, one kill and one down, and you can have three deaths, but you were at the top of that leaderboard because yep. of how much work you were putting in. And also, just to say on that last point. When we went to respawn game types, doubles, triples, fucking, both of those were kind of watered down. Like a double kill is one of the hardest things to get in years, but all those became watered down to the audience because of the amount of action that was happening and that watered yep. down gears comp. Because anytime, even though these players are working hard, doing great things, it's like, oh, is this, you know, that's what it's, that's gears, right? And, you know, they throw smokes, bounce around, kill feed, light up. You know, you're just waiting. They're, now the audience is just trained to hear the domination sound, or they're not even paying attention until they look at the scoreboard. It's like, oh my god, they reached the 200 mark. What's happening sometimes, right? To get their full attention back into the game versus the pressure always being there and them being locked in. But you know, the rounds being short it helped out a lot on that one. Like if we gave TC right, like just this very simple list, and we were like, okay, if you guys do these things, it will dramatically improve the state of the competitive scene for gears or right so all i would say is reduce slip speed distance uh like speed i don't know how much by a percentage but i'm just saying reduce mm -hmm. it right reduce the up a speed boost those two things alone make it so that you can't like knife cancel right and then outside of that the only other thing that i would want to see happen is what we're talking about right now with the back button kills assists uh deaths damage output you know, regardless of what weapon it is, just add it all up, and then the last thing would be the total score. If you, if TC could make just those two things happen in an update, it would, it could revolutionize the way we did Gears Esports. I'm not even gonna lie. Say the if two I had a day again, off with my team, are... okay. So these, this is exactly what this I would suggest good. to TC. If I had like a voice to just get get to them okay. directly, and and they actually listened, right? For the competitive community, in my opinion, personally, and I believe my whole team would agree with this, this is all that we need right now. One, reduce the slip speed, like the wall bounce slip speed, uh, just reduce it, right? Okay. Two, reduce the the uh, the up A speed boost that you get off of an up A. I'm not saying, now, if it was my choice, I would take it out completely, but I won't say that because I don't want to upset different demographics of players that I know really like that Pro and right casual. so <laughs> so i'm trying i'm trying to trying to be you know reasonable here right so i'm trying to keep them in mind every time i say something right now mm -hmm. the third thing i would say is completely take out was two, the knife though. cancel it, it yeah that was two and then the third thing i would yeah. say is completely they are taking take out the knife can cancel they are taking out, taking out the knife i'm cancel. sure they're gonna get rid of it yeah yeah so now now all three of those things 
are not things that we need to wait to prioritize. They're things that should be prioritized as number one already. There, it, there's no need to fix the shotgun right now. There's no need to do these other things. Your net code and online will work 10 times better if you do just simply those three things, right? And hopefully people from the casual community are, you know, willing to just at least give it a try, you know, hopefully. Um, and then outside of that, the only thing that we need from an analytical perspective is change the scoreboard. Kills, deaths assists damage output and then overall score and the overall score includes objective things like capping hills and breaking hills and the damage output includes none of those things it includes just simply the damage you're putting onto your opponents during the game and you take that you apply that and all of a sudden the gears broadcast can become to way be honest better with you the last the, i think if, if if i had to ask for a quick change tomorrow on something yeah. that can drastically affect the community, it may be the scoreboard. And, and and the reason why... Scoreboard's huge. The reason why is because people play... Like, when you, are, when you hop on and play Gears, a game that's difficult to learn, and you have a successful game, you just want to be somebody to tell you you did good. Even if it's the scoreboard. You just want somebody to be like, oh my god, you played fucking great. You yeah, had a great game. Tell you that you did good, not you, that you did also, you want, yeah, also you want, this is, hold on, hold on. You just, you want to have some, it needs to be something out there. And that's why a lot of people got big issues, which is playing pubs and playing rank, right? They do good, and the game tells them that they're bad. And so, yep. it's just, as a whole. I mean, statistically, statistically, half people will be bad, generally. No, but people yeah, drop a limit, so a, 100 eliminations, and unless. the game says negative 100, you're bad. <laughs> the game doesn't give you points. You could drop 100 to 100 to All eliminations. Right. So you always end up comparing yourself to everyone else. Like, yeah. yeah. Which is the reason that the Elam thing even caught on was developers trying to massage it a bit in terms of like, hey, everyone was positive Elam's for, for death or whatever. Um, yeah. So like, I think like the thing you guys should be asking for is splitting the leaderboard for ranked and uh, custom games from the leaderboard they use for everything else. Because there's... Let's say that it's very real reasons custom. that they don't show these. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the game dev. Well, no, no. Yeah, I, I just yeah. want to make sure I'm clear on what you're saying. You're, you're saying split the ranked leaderboards from from no, custom. Yeah, like make make different scoreboards for ranked and uh, custom. Don't we? But I'd have I'd have no problem with that. I wouldn't care if ranked had a yeah, different scoreboard. Yeah, I just care. I just care. I just care. Did. I just care about as a at the, at the simplest level. Like anytime I play one game. It's just that, you know, I just want to feel good as a Gears player is that, especially if I did good, that, hey, you know, it, it showed that I actually played well this game and it showed and I got positive points or, you know, the scoreboard showed my true performance and, you know, and I worked hard. And, and no matter how it's done, if you play a game of Gears and you don't feel like, oh, my God, I, I was val I played well and I was valued at the end of it, then why the hell are you playing? You're just doing, getting reps in. You're just wall bouncing all over the place and getting shotgun kills. You're playing because you think wall bouncing is interesting and getting kills is interesting. You know, it's just, but when it comes down to winning and being a good player and being better, something needs to value you correctly. I just, that's my personal opinion. Yep, 100%. And casual games, if a player sees that they have a negative kill death, for example, they're immediately less likely to play another yeah, that's the thing that I've talked to Node Zero about before. I've talked to game? him about. I've talked to him about. Yeah, if they see that they have a negative like review, they just don't want to play. Any, just, other game. any yeah, game, game, any game, any game. So Call of Duty, Rainbow Six, anything. When players see they have a negative KD, Sky's a thousand percent right. I've heard this multiple times from game devs, wow. but they just don't even want to play because they're like. But the thing is, bro, is like, huh, it, it's like, it's a fine line, right? Because we have multiple different generations of people, right? Like you got. The generation that like i feel like is my generation like the older generation like we were raised a little bit you know different than the people are nowadays now the participation Man, trophy business? era is upon us right so it's like i think personally if you had the even if they didn't get that many kills at least if they had the assists and at least if they had the damage calculator it's gotta help somewhat but if the, like sky is saying i think he's a thousand percent right like, in my mentality, it's like, yeah, get better. Like, just be better, and you'll get kills, right? Because there was once upon a time when I couldn't get many kills or anybody else that's in this, this you know, call or anybody in the chat, right? But the point is, is literally, if they want it that way, make two different scoreboards. You want to keep this game on one tooting for everybody? Okay, fine. 
give us esports players a different scoreboard if we have to, and that mm -hmm. way we could at least give, give accurate data to the public, at least for escalation. Like, because yeah, that's all we need right if, now. If, if escalation as, as, is all competitive, give escalation a different scoreboard than the rest. Because... Exactly. So that so that's <laughs> one thing. That's one thing, right? And the second thing is like, you know, isn't Gears supposed to be one of those shooters that's kind of like. You know, tough around the edges. Aren't we not supposed to have really participation trophies? Not much in this <laughs> game. Be, Isn't that what this game is supposed to be? Different. A bunch of aliens coming out of the ground and shit hits the fan and you need to toughen up or else you're going to about to, you know, be dead in the game. That's just kind of how it is. Like, yeah, even Halo was always uh, tough on that type of stuff. And we, COD we takes it a little bit easier. To toughen everyone up. What's up? We I mean, we could just toughen them a little bit. Getting around to toughen everyone up. I'm just saying, I know it's not a realistic thing, right? I know from a developer standpoint, it probably would be a joke, and TC would laugh at me if I said that. But that what, what I'm thinking... What what I'm thinking is just, like, the first thing I said about the movement, those three changes, right? That should be top one priority for balancing. And then the esports community, I do not think cares about anything else in regards to balancing right now. You give us that, we can make it work, right? And then outside of that, the As only other thing have. that we should be talking about is just the scoreboard. And TC, if you don't want your, you know, your escape and your horde players and all of your other players that love campaign and other stuff, you don't want them with that kind of scoreboard, scoreboard okay, then give us the scoreboard we need. So, like, I would be so hyped to get on the desk once in a while. If my team was done for the day, I'd be like, yo, what's up? Let me on the desk for a match. I'd be so hyped to talk data and talk analytics and all that type of stuff. Who said I was if, on the desk? If, if, we, if we had a different scoreboard, it would be so exciting to do because then we could talk so much more about these players and highlight all these different types of play styles. And that's what our game really needs right now is we need to show, you know, how special and how skilled these people are and having a better scoreboard will definitely help with that. But we need everybody to understand what makes them great and that wall bouncing like a like a fucking madman all over the map does not make you a good gears player okay uh, and it, I, well and, and, here, here's and the thing <laughs> a I lot of people guy, by the way, so uh it was real appreciate it okay yeah, have a good one sky yeah, okay yeah yeah you out sky yo it was fun yeah. having you man thanks guys all yeah, right, the man. Appreciate out. all your perspectives, bro. Joe, look what the fuck we did, okay? We, we talked the whole fucking time, and now everybody's <laughs> leaving us, and we're still on a podcast, just the two of us, okay? I, I should have did a Halo Strike exclusive got, episode. I, I... We'll, we'll we'll close it out, but hey, it was it was definitely super good though. I think for for everyone in general, um, we definitely had a lot of really good points of view from Jip. He really brought on to us like you know the casual community and stuff like that. You know, Sky bringing us the developer perspective and having so much experience working with Fortnite and all the and and all the different stuff he's worked on over his time. I think it was just overall a really good talk, you know. Yeah. And um, it's de it's definitely something that I would be proud to have, you know, TC listen to this and I'm also glad that I was able to talk about all the different perspectives I had yeah. and optimal solutions because if DC does these things we're talking about, bro. It could be life-changing for Mexico cuz yeah. cuz San Diego was so exciting, bro, because people didn't realize what happened on that update. You know what I'm saying? So they didn't know how to abuse some of the things that are available right now. So we ended up having a really good event because of that, right? But now everybody knows how to abuse these mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's really important. TC gets us that one update to make the game just a bit better so that we can bring some competitive integrity back to the game. And that's pretty much everything I got to say about and, it all right now. And, you know, until that happens, you know, uh, you know, me and, uh, you know, me and the rest, like, I feel like, you know, our job as casters too is to make, is to be entertaining today. Whatever we got today, what is the most entertaining thing that's happening? What's the storyline? How can we entertain the fans today? And uh, you know, and you know, I, I'm actually very proud of the, any, any. Oh, you guys are great. The Gears talent team. I'm actually very proud of everybody because uh, you know, even for me, on certain aspects behind the scenes, I'm gonna put like, how can you know this be perceived if we don't have no tools across? If we don't have none of these tools, like gear, like. Like to tell the stories of Gears players over the years and never have data, but and but to find a way to you know go across the board and you know make it meaningful and, and give these stories to the audience. I just feel like uh, a lot of people on the on the casting team do that very well, and uh, I'm just I'm always, I always oh, yeah. show them love, and I'm gonna show them love here as well. No, every uh, you know, every Ryan single one Jordan of our commentators, Rich, DR, Fallout Deluxe, Vincent, uh, uh, Lucy, Jordan, Jordan, uh, and. Kyle, you know, and then then on the flip end, Fruit, Ton, Toby, Trooper, uh, 
and um, the TV Azteca guys as well, and everybody over there, Brett. Um, who else? You know, you know, even all the things. Prospect that, you recently. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too, Pro- Prospect when he came on there. Yeah, you know. Uh, so yeah, all, I just, all, all, all of them did phenomenal. I, I think we have an incredible casting team. And even when I bring up the scoreboard and stuff like that, it's not taking away from how amazing these people are at their jobs because I actually am really happy with the talent team. Like, over time, I've definitely, like, I remember when I first started watching and people were first starting out, sometimes I'd have the stream on mute, but nowadays I never have it on mute at all, ever. I actually really enjoy the broadcast, and I think everybody's been elevating their game That's in good. the casting department. I think we also have some really good analysts now. Like I said, I give I give PR a lot of credit for that. I give... Um, I give Prodigy a lot of credit for that. I think those guys really are doing a really good job. You know, Ryan Fool's definitely been stepping up. Mm-hmm. Everybody, really, everybody you just mentioned, honestly. Like, Jordan's one of my favorites for sure. Benson makes it so exciting when he's there. You do a phenomenal job. Like, we have a lot of really good people in this field that we're blessed to have in the community ready to help out with this type of, you know, information in the broadcast and production. And imagine if you guys get that real data. Imagine if you give a new scoreboard to Prodigy and PR and what those dudes are going to do with it. You know what I'm saying? They're going to do a fantastic job, period. Yeah. They already do a fantastic job. And they take situations where they can't turn a lot, in, where, they, where they have little to work with, and mm-hmm. they turn it into a lot. Imagine if we give them a lot to work with. It's just going to get better and better. Then and you you're saying as a full-time coach in the stat that the I'm data that, that you got now I'm, is trash. I'm just, saying the data, I'm just saying the data that I get right now is in useful. regards to yeah. from TC – it's just unfortunately data that I can't use that much. Like my data is, is homegrown. It like it, it, it just it's just homegrown the data I have right now, and it's literally just through watching all of the footage, being there for every scrim. I think this is the first scrim mm-hmm. I've ever missed in a year today, like or years actually. Like I never miss a scrim day, but I told them I was like, this is actually a big deal because the spot our community's in. On a scale of one to ten, how valuable things. is your scoreboard data now? Just put. Like, I would say, well, here's the thing. The scoreboard data I use is a little bit, I don't want to get too into it because okay. my team will actually kill me okay, okay, if, I, okay. if, I, if I get too much into the All things right. I've created. We are, but we I'll, tell, we I'll, are. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you this. The, the document that I prepared for in Excel for San Diego was one of the most complex, like, documents using data from matches that i've ever it is the most complex document i've ever used in my entire career okay. and it covered every single match and every single round of all gameplay included since we started the team with kenny and powers and the only person that i know that's a witness of me doing that work is jordan because jordan's been at my house when i've been working on that mm-hmm. so he sees outside the game how much work i had to put into that document to be what i felt like was truly fully prepared you know for yeah. san diego and like the thing is doing work like that it's it's all manual work right like you could use fancy formulas and stuff like that through excel to make your life easier but the type of work i was doing most of it required manual data it did mm-hmm. you couldn't like set up a formula and everything just does its job for you it wasn't that simple um okay. that's the best okay. way i could explain okay. it okay. without cool. giving too much of a competitive edge. that's fine i was going you know i just said you know one to ten you know on the two is being less useful. oh one to ten uh for, useful for me what i'm doing yeah. i would say it's an eight there's always, okay. I only that's, say it's an eight. Be, I only say it's an eight because I feel like there's always room for me to improve, mm-hmm. even though that's, that's right good now, that, that that the eight is a that you can still use those eliminations and something to the, to an extent, you know, for you. But yeah, as we just, said, that it, it could be better. Like I said, it's homegrown data though, so the yeah. stats that they have on the scoreboard is not technically the stats that I'm that using. You have. I'm watching. You do a little extra I'm work. watching. I'm watching footage and I'm getting what I need from the footage myself. Gotcha. I'm not relying on anyone else to get me the information that I need other than just the gameplay. Got you. Okay. So, okay, there you go. And, but you know, in a perfect world, the game will get you most of the numbers in which you need oh, without, yeah. you, without you having to do all the extra stuff to get it. Right. And here's a perfect, here's a perfect example. Uh, JP Krez from, uh, uh, JP uh, yeah, Krez, from, who, uh, who was from, from Call of Duty. From He's a, the, the yeah. statistician over there. He does great work. I would, he does yeah. incredible. He does incredible he, work, and so, also so just, just so just to tell everybody out there, JP uh, JP Carez, uh, you know he, he worked for, for the Kyle League, and I think he still does. But what JP did was that he took all the data, and he was the stat guy, and he, he and JP would be and all the casters. He'd be like, "Yo, man, you know historically over this tournament, yo, this guy is dropping two point five four, and it was just so beautiful. The like like when I work with Kai." The numbers in which they had to tell stories, I'd be like, damn, y'all, oh, yeah. y'all got it easy over here. Y'all got yeah. it. <laughs> oh. And what's so crazy, what's so crazy, bro, about all of that, right, in regards to um, 
JP Krez, and um, I, I, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name right now. It's actually taking me off. But the analyst for Team Rocker is incredible at what he's done, cause, cause what he does, because I've seen some of his work too. Mm -hmm. And the two of them, um, one of them does all of his data homegrown, very similar to me, the one who works for Rocker, um, the analyst over there. And then the the analyst for the subliners, who's JP Krez, who used to work for MLG directly, he used to tell me like how he, I'm not going to go into how he does everything because that's his own personal work, and I won't put that out there. But I'll say this. He gets the data directly from the game, and the game makes it easy for him to have access to that data, which is like half the job right there. So if we were able to do that for Gears of War and they were able to make the data accessible, at least through the scoreboard, bro, we could can... make Gears of War so much more entertaining. Yeah. We can make we could I... we could literally finally have our casters truly and our analysts our cast and our analysts truly reaching what is their full potential because yeah. now their sources won't be limited anymore and i would just love to see that oh. someone who analyzes i analyze full-time i coach full-time and i manage full-time for reciprocity yeah and literally all three of those jobs like two of them would be significantly increased if like in regards of productivity if tc was able to make that happen for us so like i said for esports for me or, you know, coaching who's technically right now mm -hmm. the number one team in the world. And technically, I guess, you know, I'm the number one ranked coach in Gears 5 right now. You know, for me, those are the only things I want to see change what we listed. So definitely, I would say include that. And uh, technically, yeah, that's you it. are, you not. It's Gears 5. No, technically, you are? technically. I mean, why you but here's the thing I, you I don't want to be cocky. Are you not? No, I mean, I'm the number one ranked coach in the game. Correct. Right now, right now you are, right? I, then call but, yourself yeah, the fact. best coach of Gears 5 right now. That's all I wanted you to say. I just want you to say what you're that's, that, that, that's true, but I do want to be very humble about it because it's only mm -hmm. the beginning of the season, and I want to try to maintain that by the end okay, of the season. Okay, cool. That's you know cool. You be humble. Check this out, y'all. Fatal Strike, best coach Gears 5 currently, all right? He, well, one, one San Diego. Boom, done. I, I'll be cocky for you. You can stay humble. You protect your energy, Joe. That's fine. Right? I'm just trying to be sure about <laughs> protect it. You, protect your energy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I do it for you, okay? Two time, I got you. Oh man, uh, I love it. But I feel like I feel like that is a spot in which we're gonna wrap this one up. This podcast, 100. Podcast just under two hours and forty minutes on this one. Uh, it says a night. It says a night bot. We're at three hours, so that's crazy. Well, we we started. We we didn't start to like twenty minutes in though. We started like true, true. We started like twenty minutes in, and then we started going. We let the the chat fill up a bit, a little bit. Uh, so, but. Uh, Yo, guys, uh, no matter where you're watching from, uh, I appreciate you guys for tuning in. As you know, we lost Jip and Sky throughout the, the podcast because we did go on for an extended period of time, longer than we thought we was. But that's sometimes what happens when you're just having great conversation and you're talking about things you're passionate about. And uh, and, and today it was, you know, Gears of War. And we talked early on in the podcast about, you know, the uh, the route from the amateur scene, you know, kind of going up into that pro scene and some of the stuff that they dealt with, uh, the pro player side of it all. And then we got, you know, Skyless's opinion on a bunch of several different topics of, you know, from the outside looking in and from a game developer side and also from a former pro player side, you know, long time community member right there. Um, but, you know, I, I appreciate everybody in the chat watching. I appreciate the questions in which you guys sent. Uh, if you took the time to listen on Spotify, I really do love you. Make sure you follow YouTube as well. Subscribe. It's all good there. We plan on doing these hot seats every Friday around 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern. That's the goal I'm trying to hit. Uh, this week was great. Next week, I don't know who our guest may be, but I'm going I'm to throw out that tweet, and I'm going to see who just wants to come in and, and chop it up and what we want to talk about that week. Uh, not really trying to gear towards the topics, but just – Free flowing conversation about Gears of War, baby. Okay, so it's been great, man. Joe, I appreciate having you. You know, and I know Colin probably was locked in watching it the whole way through. I appreciate you, Colin, out there as well. Uh, but guys, you know, where you're, wherever you're listening from, love you. Thank you for watching. Y'all have a great day. I'll see you next week.